Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is our second uh, John C. Martin Memorial Lectureship, um, and this was formed uh, to really um, pay tribute to, to John's uh, life and science and medicine and all of the invaluable contributions he made. Um, John was an amazing scientist um, and really left a huge impact in the, in the field of virology and antiviral medicines. Um, he was also an extraordinary businessman um, as a scientist um, and created a you know, $100 million um, company um, in Gilead that today is still the leading antiviral um, pharmaceutical company in the world. And, and John also very importantly was one of the, the, the first people to really uh, um, pioneer um, the, the development of low-cost medicines for the developing world and, and really dedicated himself and Gilead to that. So, so John's, you know, through all of those contributions and, and science and business and, and, and global health, John probably, you know, had an impact that saved many millions of lives, which is something very few of us can say. Um, John served on a lot of advisory committees, presidential advisory committees, CDC, NIH, um, and he was inc incredibly generous with his time. He, we were fortunate enough to have him on the Scripps board, so we got to, and I got to interact with John a lot, both, both um, in some way as a boss, a colleague, and, and a very good friend. And, and jo John really kind of loved the model we were um, developing its scripts for, for kind of the next hundred years of our existence and, and played really a, a key role in helping develop that model and provide really critical insights in, in how to execute on the plan. So, so John has, has, has had a huge impact on us as an institution and also us as friends and colleagues. As, uh, as I said, John was incredibly generous with his time. Um, he had a way of getting to the heart of any issue um, within probably two to three sentences, okay? So um, not only did he give us a lot of new insights, he saved a lot of our time. Um, and he also had um, a tremendous humility, okay? So uh, talking to John, you wouldn't know what John's accomplishments were um, in his life. So John, you know, even after a long board meeting and drinking beer and sitting down to dinner, John would just get into science and scientific discussions and, and you know, here I just wanted another beer, but John really wanted to, to learn more. And, and so that was John. He loved discussing science, hearing about new science, hearing about the potential impact of science, and, and he was relentless in that. Um, and I think that's what the point of this memorial lectureship series is, is, is to carry on kind of John's tradition of bringing people together, having really interesting exchanges of ideas and, and, and generating whole new opportunities. Um, so, uh, we miss him dearly, and there's many times I say, it's too bad John's not here. I, we, I'd love to, to know what he thinks. Um, the, the talks today um, kind of reflect both aspects of John's, John's um, scientific life um, uh, his, his dedication to drug discovery and, and discovering new drugs um, uh, with, a, with a focus on HIV, although, you know, John really transformed not only the treatment of HIV, uh, but also hepatitis C, CMV, and, and other um, uh, major viral diseases. But we'll have the first talk by Tomas on, on you know, new approaches to HIV therapy. And then the second talk will be um, uh, from, from what I'll call an academic, um, Dave Liu, but you'll see that, that his science, basic 
basic sciences also has a huge potential to impact medicine as well. So, so those are the two speakers. I'll start out by introducing Tomas. Um, Tomas is currently the, the senior vice president um, for virology at Gilead. Um, he's, he got his PhD at IOCB in Prague, which is, we all know, one of the leading um, chemical centers for antiviral research. Um, he's been at Gilead for a very long time and has played a major role, um, certainly in their HIV programs, and, and not only the development of new medicines, but new combinations of medicines um, that have really um, facilitated the treatment at the patient level. But he's also very much involved in, in you know, leading the charge into respiratory diseases. He was a key player in the development of remdesivir, which is, you know, FDA-approved um, medication for, for COVID-19. He's also looking at, you know, how do we cure HIV? How do we make molecules that can be injected once every six months instead of a pill every day? So he's going to um, uh, tell us um, the story is targeting HIV capsid, and uh, we're looking forward to, to your talk, Thomas. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Pete, for the kind introduction and really for this uh, great opportunity and invitation uh, to be here, not only with my friends and colleagues from Gilead, but with everybody who recognized the contributions of John across the many aspects of the health and drug discovery and development. And uh, I pretty much worked with John on many capacities uh, throughout my whole time at Gilead, which is coming close to three decades now. Um, and that was also the reason why I have chosen HIV as a topic of my talk. So I'll be talking about the new class of the drugs targeting the HIV capsid, and I hope and I will be able to uh, convince you that this is really important step towards the ending the whole HIV epidemics, which is the ultimate goal. And I think we got a little bit sidetracked by COVID-19, and hopefully that will be behind us, and we can uh, focus again on the, the long-term chronic challenges of the infectious diseases, and unquestionably HIV has been one of those uh, for many, many years now. So I'd like to start from the very beginning and remind ourselves where we started and how far we actually came in the treatment and also the prevention of HIV. So you see here the molecule called zidovudine or AZT that has been approved as the first drug for HIV treatment in 1987. Uh, it was very temporary, temporary and very uh, imperfect solution. You see the graphs there um, underneath that uh, represents the viral load dynamics in the people living with HIV and treated with AZT, that's the red curve. So you see the AZT could have held the virus only for a few weeks or a couple months, and then the virus came back completely resistant to AZT. When you add the second drug to AZT, you could have held the virus a little bit longer, but it still was coming back, and it was only in 1995 and 1996, when the new class of the HIV protease inhibitors came to fruition with the Saquinavir being the first one, where actually that was the major, major first turn in the whole uh, course of the HIV epidemics uh, uh, because it resulted in the triple combination of the drugs with multiple uh, uh, complementary mechanisms. Uh, and that at least, uh, enabled to hold the virus and suppress the virus and really uh, uh, change the course of the death rate in the, uh, in the whole epidemics as you see there. So with the uh, uh, introduction of these HIV protease inhibitors, uh, uh, the course of the impact of the epidemic really uh, significantly changed. Uh, uh, you know, these were very problematic drugs. You see only just here on the picture a few uh, side effects that uh, were related to the lipid metabolism, lipid redistribution in the body. But it's not only that, it's actually, you can imagine, 
what it took every day to uh, take three times a day or, or twice a day the full handful of the pills uh, to keep the virus uh, suppressed in, in the people, and it came with the very significant side effects uh, uh, that were difficult to manage, and often people didn't stay on the uh, antiretroviral treatment. And it was only 10 years after, uh, through the work of John and many of my colleagues, some of them are actually here in the audience, Taink or Bill Lee, uh, where Gilead came in with the first uh, uh, single tablet regimen for the treatment of the HIV in 2006, and that was the A-tripla and combination of the two nucleosides with non-nucleotide inhibitor. And as subsequent to that in 2018, after actually Gilead uh, successfully developed multiple single tab tablet regimen, in 2018, the, the last one called Bictarvi, uh, that's a combination of two nucleosides and integrase inhibitor, was approved. Uh, and you, you can look at the significant uh, change in the overall uh, amount of the active uh, ingredients. So it was more than a gram in A-tripla, and it was less than 300 milligrams uh, in, uh, in Bictarvi, uh, which led to a significantly less potential for any side effects. So what do we have now? Uh, we have the amazing drug that is the uh, best-in-class single tab tablet regimen that uh, basically is capable of suppressing the virus over multiple years, pretty much in more than 98% of the people who stay on the therapy with minimal side effects, and very importantly, with zero failure because of the drug resistance. So the question is how much better we can actually do compared to this. I mean, this is really the standard of care. Um, that currently is being used by about 50% of all HIV uh, or people with HIV as an as a, a initial treatment. Well, there is a lot that we still can do, uh, and that's related to the overall uh, challenges with the taking the daily regimens. Uh, people with HIV who are on the daily pills often tell us um, that they suffer from the pill fatigue, that they have the emotional uh, connection to the treatment that reminds them every day that they live with the deadly virus, and if they don't take the pill, the virus will take over uh, their life. And uh, so when we talk to the people with HIV and ask them what would be the better solution is anything that can be less frequent, anything that we don't have to take the bottle of the pills with the pills rattling there in my backpack, I would take it. So uh, that's a, something that really leads to the desire of having the individualized uh, antiviral treatment for, uh, for the people with HIV. And then when we move to prevention, right, we now, and I'll talk about it in a minute, we have a three drugs that have been approved for the prevention, two orals and one injectable. Uh, but it's difficult for people uh, to take the pills every day um, just to, uh, just to uh, stay safe and be protected from the virus. So many people couldn't have done it. So we need to pivot. We need to find the new tools. We need to find the new ways how to uh, maintain compliance and how to make it easier and be able to find the medicines that can fit to people's different life needs. And that's where we are pivoting right now, not just Gilead, but other players in the field is going from once daily regimens to long acting uh, antiretrovirals. Um, that can be given either orally or by injection uh, much, much less frequently and would make it all HIV treatment as well as prevention a lot more convenient and e easy to take and uh, compliance uh, would be affected in a very positive way. But we cannot lose the side of the big picture. This is the statistics, most recent statistics from UNAIDS about the whole HIV epidemics. Uh, currently, there are almost 38 million people living with HIV. Uh, one quarter of them or more don't really have the access globally to any antiretroviral treatment. And those who are, uh, probably 30% of them are not virally suppressed. In addition, uh, about 15 to 20% of people who are estimated to live with HIV are not aware of their HIV status which further fuels and promotes the transmission and perpetuation of the, of the HIV epidemics. 
So it's very clear that in this case, if we want to end the epidemics globally, we really need to have the new innovative tools that would help us to do so. So here, that's where the HIV capsid is coming in the picture. Uh, there were about two decades of the research, basic research on the uh, HIV capsid uh, function within the virus replication cycle. And so this is the simplified version of the way how the HIV infects the CD4 T cells, replicates inside the cells, and uh, generates the new virus progeny with the multiple copies it itself. And uh, uh, these steps that are depicted here are all critical. So when you stop the virus in one of these steps, the replication cycle doesn't finish, the new virus doesn't come out. And the HIV capsid is uh, the cone-shaped green structure that is there traveling through the part of the uh, uh, infected cells into the nucleus where it disassembles and delivers the, uh, the uh, Co the complementary DNA copy of the viral genome that gets integrated into the host chromosome. And then on the other side, the, uh, the expression of the HIV proteins leads to the budding of the virus and assembly and maturation of the viral particle. And you see that basically the capsid is present in the five out of the six essential step of the HIV replication cycle. And uh, that what makes it a fairly interesting target for potential new antiretrovirals. So how the capsid comes about, how it gets assembled, there is a polyprotein uh, that HIV express in infected cells called GAG uh, that is cleaved by HIV protease during the maturation process. And that's where the capsid uh, subunit is released. Uh, it's also called P24 because it has a 24, 24 kilodalton size protein. And about 1,500 of these subunits assembled together to form the cone-shaped structure uh, that is basically like small compartment or canister that delivers the genetic material of the HIV into the newly infected cells. And the cone-shaped stru cone structure always puzzled people and structural chemists. and. Uh, uh, one of them, uh, Wesley Sunquist for, from University of Utah in Salt Lake City, finally solved the puzzle why this is the cone-shaped structure. It actually is formed from about 25, uh, tw uh, 250 hexamers and exactly 12 pentamers. And if you distribute the pentamers in an une un uneven way at the bottom and the top of the capsid, that's where you get a cone shape. And this is principle that is well known from the Fuller and chemistry that was Sunquist uh, applied to actually solve the structure of the, of the HIV capsid. Um, so here's a small movie that kind of shows you how the HIV capsid uh, is assembled. The hexamers are actually the subunits uh, that can be expressed uh, in vitro and purified, but it comes together as a trimer of the dimers. And uh, so about 250 of these subunits gets assembled. Uh, it's believed that it's formed from the narrow end to the wide end. And it needs to be closed with the exact number of the seven pentamers. But depending on where the pentamers are placed within the uh, lattice of the HIV capsid, the capsid can get different shapes. So you see here, it's quite irregular. Um, the angle of the capsid could also be very different. So when you take the electron micrographs of the virus, you can see all kinds of distributions of the shapes and the um, and, and the angles of the capsid. What is important, it has to be cone because that makes it metastable. And there is a very important step in the disassembly of the capsid during the early stage of the virus replication. So almost as long as the capsid has been known, there has been a search for the potential binders of, or inhibitors of HIV capsid. And they, in principle, come in the two different categories. The, uh, so-called inhibitors, they bind to the monomer of the capsid and they slow down the polymerization of the capsid lattice. So they basically inhibit the building and closure of the capsid in the late stage of the virus replication. On the other hand, the, uh, what are the accelerators are the molecules that bind to the hexamer. And they make the hexamers to come together faster or more efficiently, uh, but 
in an aberrant way. So it's in a way that the virus cannot tolerate. There needs to be exact kinetics of the, how the cone-shaped structure is coming together. And so you see some of the examples of the molecules that have been identified as either the inhibitors or the accelerators uh, of uh, the polymerization of the HIV capsid. So we got interested in HIV capsid in 2006. So that's a 17 years ago. And we started basically, the interest started based on the very rich literature about the function of the capsid, the structure of the capsid. And what probably swayed us most were several articles about specific uh, point mutations in the P24 poly protein uh, that made the capsid completely non-functional. Some of these mutants still build the capsid, but the virus was not infectious. Some of the mutants couldn't form the capsid at all. And so it sort of became suggestive that if you can mimic with the small molecules some kind of the function phenotypically of these, uh, of these single mutants, we might have a drug that interferes with the capsid function. So we started the project with high throughput screening campaign because at that time there were really no lead chemical matter or small molecules that we can take and optimize it uh, into the drug-like properties. It took us two years and it take about 50 or 60 grams of the protein to express and purify so that we can run the in vitro polymerization assay. In the end, we found a first generation lead that really led nowhere, actually. We couldn't optimize it. We couldn't break the one micromolar antiviral potency, no matter what we have done. So in 2010, uh, there was a publication from the Pfizer scientists who actually worked not far from here, uh, led by Wade Blair, one of the virologists there, and they identified a small molecule uh, that really bound into the capsid. Um, and that became potentially additional chemical matter based on which we can build. And so we took that path and really worked hard in the large team of the chemists and did the impressive work over the six years. Um, and you see here on this chart where there is a time on the x-axis and the potency on the y-axis. The lower the point is, the more potent the compound is. So in the end of the 2016, that's where compound called GS6207 initially, the generic name of Lena Kapover was discovered. And that became the final candidate uh, molecule um, as a new class of the HIV capsid inhibitors. Now, when you really want to compress the six plus years of the hard work and making 4,000 compounds, you use this slide. And, and that depicts the original molecule from Pfizer that had a micromolar potency it is basically dipeptide mimetics. It has no stability. It, it, dis, it basically disappeared in the presence of the uh, liver microsomes. So it, is, it was a very difficult starting point, actually, to do anything with it. But really, the long, hard work of the chemistry team ultimately to let, led to Lena Kapover with potency that was more than 12,000-fold improved compared to the starting molecule with incredible uh, metabolic stability and in vivo half-life that was uh, longer than 10 days. And we had to overcome the multiple uh, challenges in the drug design, both on the potency uh, optimization, stabilization of the molecule, as well as potential for cytochrome P450 inhibition, drug-drug interactions, uh, PGP substrativeness, uh, uh, oral bioavailability, and such. So we now know how Lena Kapaver actually interacts with HIV capsid. As you see here on the right-hand side, the hexamer, and Lena Kapaver, based on the X-ray structure, binds at the interface of two, two subunits, the two P24 subunits and basically acts as a staple. It makes the hexamer much more stable, and that's why it is acting as an accelerator of the, uh, primarily as an accelerator of the HIV capsid formation. It is most potent antiretroviral drug um, that has ever been approved and identified with less than 
100 picomolar um, antiviral or EC50 activity. And even in the presence of the high plasma protein binding, the 95% inhibition of the virus still occurs at a single digit nanomolar. So you see on this sort of bar graph, the comparison of the antiviral activity of Lenacapaver with some of the lead compounds uh, 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 that are representatives of the other classes of the antiretroviral agents, including the protease and integrase inhibitors. There is very low cytotoxicity in vitro, which leads to the enormous selectivity index of more than a quarter of a million as the ratio of the CC50 and EC50. Also, Lenacapaver, because it targets a different, uh, different function of the virus than any other antiretrovirals, doesn't uh, uh, exhibit any cross-resistance with the mutants that can emerge to, uh, on the treatment with other antiretroviral classes. So it's a simple profiling experiment where we made a mutant viruses that has the mutations causing the resistance to uh, maturation inhibitors, protease inhibitors, nucleoside, reverse transcriptase, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, as well as integrase strength transfer inhibitors. And you see in the first row, this is a fault change in the EC50 antiviral activity, and there is basically no change against any of these mutants in terms of the activity and response to lenacapavir. While each of the representative of the individual classes, they always lose the majority of the antiviral activity against the respective mutants in the target for these molecules. But that doesn't mean that resistance is no issue, right? The resistance is always the possibility for any direct acting antiviral. And so we wanted to learn what it is about with Lenacapaver. So we took two different approaches in principle that are frequently used in the antiviral research. You can either culture the virus at the increasing concentrations of the, of the inhibitor and slowly increase the pressure, the selection pressure on the virus particle, and then see what mutations come up. So that's the top part, that's the, that's the top uh, approach that we have taken. And you can see uh, over the multiple passages, lasting for a total of more than 100 days, there were a few muta mutations that emerged in the P24 uh, protein, the HIV capsid subunit. The other approach is we use the different level of the drug, fixed dose uh, concentration that potentially can mimic the therapeutic levels that can be achieved in humans. And when you do it that way, it still takes quite a bit of time, uh, but also several different mutations ultimately have been identified. And what's interesting on the right-hand side, that is the structure of the Lenacapaver bound to the interface of the two monomer subunits, and all the mutations that have been identified are basically aligning the binding site on, at the interface of the two capsid monomers. Uh, what is important about these mutants uh, is the phenotype, it's the growth phenotype, because the capsid as such is the essential, plays the very essential function. So we were interested in you know, the virus can develop the resistance, but with these resistance mutations, can it actually replicate efficiently? So uh, you see in the first uh, row is basically fault uh, change in the antiviral activity against these different mutants that we have identified. And then we had two systems where we can measure quantitatively the replication capacity or efficiency of, the, of those mutant viruses. And you see pretty much among those two assays, the more resistance there is, the less replication relative to the wild type efficiency is there for those mutants. So the mutants are not very fit because they need to fit basically, they need to find the balance between the drug pressure and the biological, essential biological functions for these mutants. Part of that is that the whole active site where, or the site where Lenacapaver is binding at the interface of the two subunits, is almost 100% conserved across, across all clades of the HIV. So HIV has a multiple subtypes, multiple clades geographically. It's probably one of the most diverse viruses that we know of. It's a, on two orders of magnitude more diverse than is the influenza, for example. But the site where Lenacapaver interacts with the capsid is pretty much 100% conserved across all these uh, all these different subtypes, which is telling us indirectly that that site plays some critical essential function 
um, in the whole uh, uh, replication cycle. Um, the other interesting part is we looked at the, you can dissect the HIV replication cycle and make two different assays. In one, you look at the so-called early events, which is from the entry of the virus all the way to the integration of genetic material into the host chromosome. So you can construct a uh, assay where you measure only this part of the cycle. And also, complementary to that, you can construct an assay or develop the assay where you measure only the late stage of the replication, which starts with the expression of the proteins for the from the integrated provirus all the way to the release and maturation of the newly infected viral particles. And you see that Lena Kapaver actually works in both of these parts, suggesting that it, it can interfere with the different functions in the different phases of the replication cycle. The overall activity of Lena Kapaver is very likely driven by, primarily by the early stage effect, because the overall full cycle and our activity is within the same ballpark as the effect on the early stage. But we were interested why it is that uh, the vastly different functions in different parts of HIV replication cycle could be affected by Lena Kapaver. <coughs> so we developed the multiple binding assays to the different forms of the capsid that play the role in the different stages of replication cycle. So you see in the, each column is the, is the binding uh, by biocor assay, biochemical assay, and that, uh, uh, the, that, that can quantify the affinity to the GAG polyprotein, to the capsid monomer, capsid pentamer, as well as capsid hexamer. And you can see that the, the affinity, the picomolar affinity, the highest affinity is really for the pentamer and hexamer. Um, and it's less, it still can bind with the less affinity to, even to the GAG polyprotein, suggesting that the binding side is actually part of the polyprotein be before it's cleaved and matured by the HIV protease. When you look at the, the hexamer binding with one of the high level resistance mutants, you see the huge shift in the affinity. It loses the binding because of this one single point mutant. So now I'll talk a little bit about what is the mechanism actually for the, uh, the interference with the early stage of the replication cycle. And there are some simple bread and butter antiviral experiments that we can do. One of them is the time of addition activity. And there is an assumption that the replication cycle, if you have a single cycle assay, where you can measure the input and output of the virus just over the window of one cycle without spreading into the neighboring cells, and you add the compound or the inhibitor at the different times after the infection of the cells, and you measure the antiviral activity. And at a time when there is a loss of the antiviral activity, that kind of gives you the window where the effect is happening. So we did that uh, and compared the uh, Lena Kapaver with the two known uh, uh, antiretrovirals, the rilpivirin, which inhibits the reverse transcription, as well as Bictegravir, which is the inhibition of, of the integration of the virus. And you see in the curve there that uh, um, Lena Kapaver is losing activity at the same time as the, as the integrase inhibitor, but it's after the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which suggests that it doesn't interfere with reverse transcriptase. It, it, it interferes with the uh, steps that follow and so this was corroborated in, with a different series of experiments where you see on the right-hand side where we measured the total reverse transcripts by, this is all by quantitative PCR, you can measure the different forms of the genome as it matures within the infected cells. It doesn't affect the uh, reverse transcription, but it affects the integration. The integrated provirus drops to zero in the presence of Lena Kapaver. But Lena Kapaver is not an integrase inhibitor. That was one of the early you know, essays that we have done to confirm that's not the case. So how can Lena Kapaver or the capsid inhibitors with this mechanism actually interfere with the integration if they bind to the capsid? So we used a tool compound that was at the time when Lena Kapaver was in the early stage of the development. The tool compound looks very similar. It has a few modifications, uh, but overall the antiviral activity on the early and late stage is very similar to Lena Kapaver. So, and we also had the X-ray crystal structure with this tool compound and we knew that it binds exactly the same way. And so we developed an assay which captured basically the 
uh, loca localization of the viral profile DNA and the HIV capsid protein within the infected cells. So when you look at the, the images there, uh, at the bottom is the green uh, staining for the HIV capsid protein. The middle is the staining for the viral DNA. Uh, when you merge the two, at some point, the, two, the, the signal basically uh, 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 differentiate in the different direction and different location. Uh, and the different uh, drugs with the different antiviral mechanisms can actually affect uh, the signal from these two different readouts. So real pivirin, which is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, basically eliminates the presence of the viral DNA because it inhibits reverse transcription. Dolutegravir, which is inhibitor of integration, maintains the presence of the DNA within the nucleus because the DNA makes it to the nucleus. What happens with this uh, capsid inhibitor, it actually doesn't allow the entry of the HIV capsid protein and the DNA into the nucleus. So the proviral DNA is formed, completed, but it cannot enter into the nucleus, and hence the integration is, uh, is blocked. So to look at a little bit more what's happening, we need to understand how the HIV capsid actually gets into the nucleus. And there was a lot of debate and discussion whether it's the intact capsid that actually gets into nucleus or whether the capsid needs to uh, disassemble before the entering into the nucleus. And the most recent observations actually indicates very clearly that's the intact capsid that gets through the nuclear pore uh, via the specific interactions with some host factors, one of them is CPSF6, the other is NUP-153. And when we look at the structures of the binding of these different factors, host factors, uh, to the HIV capsid and where Lenacapaver binds, these two binding sites are completely overlapping. So the host factors that, that, that mediates the traveling or the, the transport of the HIV capsid into the nucleus binding to the same spot as Lenacapaver itself. And that's shown here uh, when you look at the co-precipitation, immunocoprecipitation, um, that these two factors can co-precipitate with the HIV capsid. When you add lenacapaver, uh, the interaction is uh, vastly diminished. So that's one mechanism. The other is actually, that's been shown by our colleagues uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, University of Utah that the uh, lenacapaver can stabilize the HIV capsid and makes it a lot more rigid. So the curve that is you know, steeping down is the, just the natural disassembly of isolated HIV capsid. When you add lenacapaver, a different concentration, uh, the disassembly is significantly slowed down. And we know it rigidifies the whole cone, so the cone cannot be flexible, cannot make it through the uh, nuclear pore. What about the late stage events? So Lenacapaver is also able to modulate the assembly and polymerization of the capsid. So this is a simple in vitro assay where we take the P24 monomer subunits at certain concentration, we add a salt, and that triggers the polymerization. So if you do that in the absence of any inhibitors, you get well-shaped uh, sort of the tubes that are formed primarily of the hexamers. When you add the lenacapaver at different concentrations, it actually significantly accelerates the polymerization process. And that's because it enhances the hexamer interactions. And you end up with the uh, product that is totally useless for the virus. It's basically the blob of the polymerized capsid that doesn't give the rise of any meaningful shape of the HIV capsid. And you see that actually on the right-hand side in the electron micrographs, where in the control you can recognize the cone shape uh, structure of the, of the, of the uh, HIV capsid. But in the presence of lenacapaver, you either see the aberrant structures that don't close, or you don't see any formation of any condensed material. So what we can say now when we look at the overall replication cycle of the HIV, that lenacapaver actually interferes with at least three different parts of the replication cycle. 
So that's one of the features that is rather unusual because all of the other antiretrovirals hit only one distinct point in the replication cycle, whether it's a reverse transcription, integration, or virus maturation. <coughs> the other aspects are physical chemical properties of the molecule. Uh, it breaks four out of five Lipinski rules quite severely in terms of the molecular weight, hydrophobicity, solubility, and pretty much every atom of the Lena kappa has, has its function and its meaning either for the potency or for the stability of the molecule. But what we have also discovered is that the physical chemical properties and the low solubility are very uh, amenable for the supporting the uh, administration as the subcutaneous dosing with a very slow release. So if you want to think about a long-acting agent that can be administered by injection very infrequently, there are several parameters that affect the dose and the frequency of the dosing. One of them, of course, is the potency. The higher potency, the less drug you need to achieve the efficacious dose in vivo. The other is the metabolic clearance. The faster the drug is cleared, the more you need to put into the system to maintain the effective doses. But also to balance the, uh, the overall uh, uh, level of the drug in the systemic circulation, it needs to have a certain release rate from the depot after the injection. And that is really affected by the physical chemical properties, by the form of the compound, by the salt, and that's where the, a lot of optimization technically is required to achieve this long-lasting exposure. But as you see on the right-hand side there, in the several preclinical species in the pharmacokinetic studies, we have been able to establish that if we give one single uh, subcutaneous injection of lenacapavir, it can last for pretty much half a year at the concentrations that are above of the inhibitory levels, even when adjusted for the protein binding. So this was really the, one of the most uh, important aspects of the, uh, of the late stage of the optimization of the molecule, and it was sort of the revelation when we actually realized at the beginning the intention wasn't to come up with something that can be long-acting, infrequent, injectable drug. But with the modification and the optimization of the compounds, we arrived at the molecule that basically was like eye-opening, that now that basically opens completely new frontier. So we tried to build on that. We filed the IND in 2018, started the phase one uh, pharmacokinetic and the, and the efficacy studies in the people with HIV. Um, and so the phase one is a very simple study where you take the different dose levels, you give just a single ejection to people who have the detectable viral load and they are on no drugs, and you try to measure the viral dynamics over the short period of time of about 10 to 12 days. And you see the pharmacokinetics on the, on the left-hand side where really the drug lasts for 24 weeks, which is a pretty much half a year. Uh, but because it was new drug, FDA, for the good reasons, allow us to the monotherapy only for 10 days. So how you do that at the end of the study, you actually add the approved antiviral product, which in this case was Bictarvi. But nevertheless, within the interval of those 10 days, we were able to see up to two logs or 100-fold reduction of the viral replication just with the single agent. So we work further to understand what is the real potential of this uh, long uh, um, half-life and the stability of the compound. So here you see the studies in the pharmacokinetics, both after the single subcutaneous dose as, as well as after the single oral dose. And uh, you can appreciate that uh, the optimized formulation on the left-hand side actually gives the half-life of up to 11 weeks, which makes it uh, pretty nice and solid product for once every six month administration. On the other hand, the oral uh, administration uh, is uh, giving a half-life of about 12 days. That's because there is no depot. You take the one dose, it gets into the systemic circulation and it's cleared. If you have the injectable material, you form the depot from which the compound is slowly released and that contributes to the much longer half-life. 
So the molecule really is very versatile. It can be administered through the injection once every six months, or it could be administered as a pill once a week and maintaining the, the levels of the drug that are highly effective uh, against the virus in people. So to build on these observations, we really established a pretty extensive clinical program for Lena Kapaver, both in HIV treatment as well as in prevention. So you see the list of some of the studies. The first one that we start is to build on the fact that there is no cross-resistance of Lena Kapaver with the other antiretroviral classes, which makes it the ideal product for the highly treatment experienced people who have the resistance to the multiple antiretroviral drugs, they cannot suppress the virus with existing compounds. So lenacapavir was added to what's called optimized background regimen, which you basically give the patient the best drug combination that they can have given their resistance profile to multiple drugs. And that was a successful program that actually led to the approval of lenacapavir by the end of last year in multiple countries. But for the, the treatment uh, uh, of the naive patients or virally suppressed patients to switch to the uh, therapy that is more convenient, uh, one drug is not enough. So one needs to have a combination of at least two drugs in the virally suppressed patient. So currently we have a several programs like that. One of them is a combination with two broadly neutralizing antibodies in the phase two. We also have the once daily uh, combination with Bictegravir, the leading HIV integrase inhibitor, uh, currently in phase three. Combination with is Latravir, which is the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. That's, co co that's a collaboration with Merck. And, and very recently, we actually uh, initiated the phase one studies in human with the prodrug of lenacapavir to increase the oral bioavailability and potentially uh, prolong the dosing interval. Very importantly, we also have the uh, two major studies, phase three studies, as a single agent for HIV prophylaxis, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute. So a little bit about the study in highly treatment experience patients. So these are the people who have detectable, uh, detectable viral load while on therapy. Um, so this study is uh, simply designed as a lead-in functional immunotherapy for uh, oral remdesivir, or sorry, for oral enacapavir to establish the baseline efficacy in the people who have very limited option to be treated with uh, other drugs, and that it follows with the maintenance of the subcutaneous administration every six months. With the primary endpoint at, uh, I believe, the uh, 52 weeks. So here you see the results of the, uh, of the study after one year on lenacapavir treatment. So the people normally couldn't suppress the virus. When the lenacapavir is added, overall, uh, more than 70% of the people maintain the undetectable viral load. And it is similar, similarly efficacious across the different demographic uh, groups, regardless of the age, uh, race, uh, uh, or the region where the study has been conducted. Also, very importantly, the level of the resistance to other antiretroviral drugs that the people are on doesn't really affect the suppressive effect of lenacapavir, as you see on the right-hand side, the, the other uh, uh, bar graph. Now, another study in the phase two was in the virally suppressed people, and this was really to test either two or three drug combination with lenacapavir. The way how it has been done is in these different four different treatment groups, uh, when the lenacapavir subcutaneous once every six months or lenacapavir once daily oral has been combined uh, initially with the three drug regimen, but subsequently after six months switched to two drug regimen. Uh, and this was uh, conducted side by side with the control arm, which is the big tar with the standard of care single tablet regimen, with the primary endpoint at 28 weeks and the secondary endpoint at 80 weeks. So that was the one year on the, uh, prim on the dual antiretroviral therapy. So you see the overall profile here of the viral load suppression. Um, and uh, they're basically among the arms, there was no difference. Uh, among the people who remained on the treatment, uh, whether this was the once daily oral or once every six months subcutaneous, 
and the, the level of the suppression in the 95, 98% of the people treated is pretty much on par with the standard of care, which is the once daily um, big Tarvi combination single tablet regimen. We also looked at the emergence of the resistance in these different studies. So uh, you see the three studies that uh, I have referred to. The first two are the phase two studies. Uh, the Capella study was in the uh, treatment experience people. So overall, uh, we found a, a emergence of the resistance among eight out of the total 72 people treated with Lena Kapaver. And this was primarily in the cases where the Lena Kapaver was so-called functional monotherapy. In that case, none of the other drugs that the patients were on were actually fully efficacious. So they cannot suppress the virus. And when the virus replicates in the presence of one compound, it's often uh, the case that the resistance may, may emerge. So that explains the little bit higher frequency of the resistance in the highly treatment experienced patients. On the other hand, the Calibrate study was in the virally suppressed people. So we saw only two cases out of 150 people treated with, uh, uh, with Lena Kapaver, which is uh, about one and a half percent uh, resistance frequency, which is very similar to most of the antiretroviral drugs. I want to also mention this study, and that's very unique in a sense that this is currently the only regimen um, that is active as a once every six months treatment. And that's a combination of lenacapavir with the two broadly neutralizing antibodies that Gilead is developing. And the simple question was, when we combine lenacapavir with two broadly neutralizing antibodies, can, th can this combination maintain the suppression of the virus? Uh, over the prolonged period of time. The challenge with the broadly neutralizing antibodies is that not, not a single, there is no single neutralizing, although it's called broadly neutralizing, there is no single antibody that can neutralize all the clades and the subtypes of the HIV. So you need to combine at least two or more in order to get the breadth of the coverage across the different viruses. So these two, a broadly neutralizing antibodies, they uh, neutralize about 95% of all the isolates that we have looked at. So they have been, uh, the antibodies were given at two different doses, one of them. One of them was given at 30 milligrams per kick, the other uh, in one arm at 10 and the other arm at 30 milligrams and uh, combined with standard subcutaneous dose of lenacapover. So this is how the treatment regimen actually looks. Because of the slow buildup of the exposure of lenacapavir after subcutaneous injection, we need the so-called loading regimen. So this is in the first row in the table on the left-hand side. People need to take two pills on day one, two pills on day two, uh, and then, uh, then one injection or two injections, and it covers it for six months. And that was combined with the single infusion of the two antibodies. And we were not sure what we could see, actually, because there are a number of the uh, examples where the broadly neutralizing antibodies don't hold against the resistance emergence. But we were very pleasantly surprised that among the 20 people on this small proof of concept trial, 18 out of those 20 actually maintained the suppression for the half a year. So this is potentially the first regimen that can be administered only once every six months uh, to maintain the viral load suppression. In my last part, I want to get into what is probably the most important potential of Lena Kapaver, and that is to make the difference in the prophylaxis of HIV infection. Uh, through the, a lot of epidemiological research, it is well established now that in the places in the world where the treatment is well accessible, where the PrEP also can be frequently used, there is a significant drop in the overall rate of the HIV infection. And you see that um, in a few examples. As I mentioned earlier, we currently have a three products for HIV prophylaxis for people who are at a high risk of the acquisition of HIV infection. Two of them are single tablet pills, uh, Truvada and Descovi, approved in 2012 and 2019, both developed uh, by Gilead. And the second one, and the third one, is the, is the injectable once every two months integrase inhibitor uh, developed by uh, VFA GSK. And so all three of these drugs are available um, but uh, despite of that, 
there is still less than one million people uh, that are taking the PrEP. Uh, the people at risk of HIV acquisition is many, many times higher. So our question was, can actually the infrequent dosing of the single agent, the HIV capsid inhibitor, uh, uh, be useful for the, uh, for the HIV PrEP? So we started with the uh, non-human primate studies uh, where there is a virus called SIV or simian immunodeficiency virus that can infect non-human primate like rhesus macaques. And so we have given this virus uh, at increasing uh, inoculum over the time of about 15 or 16 weeks following the single injection, subcutaneous injection, of the tool compound that I described earlier, which has a very similar properties uh, as Lena Kapaver. And we had the two different dose levels at that single injection. And what we saw is considerable delay in the uh, acquisition of the infection, dose dependent. So the gray uh, plot represents the control uh, animals that have, uh, uh, have not been treated with anything or have been treated with placebo and the low and high dose. And you can see that by week 15, the high dose basically maintains the undetectable virus and animals that have not acquired the infection at the point when all the control animals have been already infected. And we measured the pharmacokinetics of Lena Kapaver in these animals, and it was only when the level of the drug dropped below plasma-adjusted EC95 when the animals became infected. Now, you remember some of the pharmacokinetics plot, the target exposure in human is five times that. So that gave us a significant confidence that actually single drug at the clinical exposure can protect very efficiently against the uh, HIV acquisition. So to prove that, uh, we have initiated an extensive program of the clinical studies uh, to test the Lena Kapover once every six months as the single injection uh, for the pre-exposure prophylaxis of HIV. We have two studies in different populations. The purpose one is in the adolescent girls and young women, primarily in Africa. The other purpose two is in the uh, men who have sex with men, transgender women, transgender men, and, uh, and gender non-binary uh, people who have had a high risk of the HIV acquisition. These are huge studies. You see several thousand people in each study. And we also planned several smaller studies to have a, them in a particular geographic locations uh, that would be needed for the filing the approval uh, for the PrEP for Lena Kapover. One important point is that unlike the three products that I have shown that are approved for HIV prophylaxis, if you are developing the HIV PrEP in 2020s, it really requires, com requires completely different approach and strategy. So one of them is the education of the people who are at the higher risk, explaining them what are the potential benefits of the PrEP. And so we have taken that approach, particularly in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, to connect with the uh, PrEP users, to connect with community members, to connect with the advocacy group. So you see here on the right-hand side is a, is a picture of our team that uh, visited South Africa in 2019 to start the Purpose One study. What is also very important is the original design that led to approval of those PrEP uh, uh, products cannot apply anymore. And the simple reason is that there is already standard of care for PrEP. So it is unethical to run the studies that we have the placebo as a control. So what we needed to do to find the alternative approach, and the, alterna and the uh, clinical studies, they need to have the control arm, right? So uh, with a lot of discussion with FDA, we uh, actually ended up with a plan to use the synthetic arm, which would be based on the counterfactual estimate of the frequency of HIV in each geographical location where the clinical studies are run. And therefore, you don't need a placebo control, you don't need the other comparative arm. You just run one arm and you figure out what is the local levels of the HIV infection using so-called recency assay. That assay is there to allow us to understand 
over the last year or so, how many acquisition of HIV were there based on the maturation of the antibodies in the people who are recently infected. So this is really, I think, the moment where if Lenacapaver is actually approved for PrEP, where it can make the huge impact on the course of HIV epidemics because of the simplicity of how it can be used for the PrEP. But the technical success is not enough. So we are involved in many aspects of advancing the health equity and access around the world. Part of it is enabling the access to the uh, HIV medicine to more than 16 people around the world, funding and supporting many programs in the communities that together would enable the better access and better acceptance of the treatment and PrEP. One of them is in, a, in the south of the United States where some of the political climate and, uh, and the culture really doesn't allow easily to access the treatment and particularly PrEP. And altogether, I think we hope that it would allow us to get, come closer to the ending the HIV epidemics. So what remains to be said now is really to recognize the many of my colleagues at Gilead. There were about a thousand people or more who work over the course of the discovery and development of Lenacapaver, which now as a, uh, as a drug named Sandlenka has been approved in the multiple countries and is the only regimen that can be given to people with HIV once every six months. And I really want to close the talk with commemorizing John as one of the mentors and inspirations for me through the whole course of the time when I worked at Gilead. He was really the pioneer and visionary a businessman and scientist, as we've heard from Pete. And I think he was always most natural with his friends and colleagues. And you see a number of the pictures here over the time since early days of Gilead. Uh, uh, I think the one in the black and white is the, is, is the leadership of Gilead in 1995 or 1996. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you again uh, for the invitation, for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for that amazing talk, Tomas. It's, it's nice to see the tradition John started at Gilead is still going strong. Um, we have time for questions. It's hard for us to see. <laughs> I, I have one question to start. So, so you went from a handful of pills to single pill to maybe one, an injection once every six months. How are you thinking about a cure? Uh, that's all another talk for maybe an hour or longer, but uh, uh, it's worth trying, right? It's very aspirational um, and ambitious, and I think we also are very closely involved in the HIV cure. What is clear is the direct antivirals have no impact on the latent reservoir of HIV, so you have to use completely different approaches and mechanisms how to reduce or eliminate the latent reservoir. That's what the cure is about, right? And a lot of those mechanisms are immune-based, whether it's the immune modulators, effective therapeutic vaccines, that will help people to build the immunity, the lasting immunity that can control the virus and potentially over time lead to the reduction or elimination of the reservoir. I, I don't think it would be easy to achieve that without good immune control of the virus. I think the resistance, yeah, I'll take the second question first. I think the resistance emerges in the active side, 
And that act, the binding site, that is there present throughout the whole replication cycle. So we actually introduce some of the mutations into the virus and ask the question, does the, is the early stage activity affected or the late? And it turned out that both of them are affected to about the same extent, which structurally and at the molecular level makes perfect sense. Yeah. Sorry, the first question was? Just the, the tremendous efficacy of the compound, is it due to the multiple sites of activity in the life cycle of the capsid? That's probably part of it. The other part of it is that a capsid function is very different than the inhibition of the enzymes, right? All the other antiviral targets are basically enzymes where you have a certain stoichiometry that you need to have to diminish the you know, level of the reverse transcription or integration. The capsid itself, because it's such a precision structure, if you actually poison it with few molecules here and there, the structure never takes the shape. It never works the way as it's supposed to. So the, we, completely, we don't understand completely the stoichiometry, but a part of it is also the picomolar affinity to the hexamer, right? So the, the molecule is really fully optimized to the maximum potency and affinity you can actually achieve with such molecules. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, how, how it's going to be implemented. So after the discussion with FDA, actually, we came to an alignment where the synthetic arm will be used, uh, will be built, basically, from the time of the screening of the people to enter into the study, right? When you go into a certain location, you start screening people because you want to have HIV negative people at risk of the HIV acquisition. When you do the screening, you actually capture a number of the people who are already positive. They may not even know about it, right? And over a certain narrow window, you can run this recency assay and say how long ago this person has been infected. And based on the maturation of the antibodies against HIV, you can, you can measure the affinity of the antibody from each person and determine whether the person was infected recently or five years ago. And then you count the number of the recent infection over the last six to 12 months, and that gives you the baseline frequency of the infection within that location, right? And you do it in every location of the trial, and from that you build a synthetic arm of overall frequ expected frequency without any intervention. We haven't tried, but the broadly neutralizing antibodies are tricky molecules, right? Just the fact that, at least from in vitro and the monotherapy in the people, it's clear that the virus can very quickly um, develop resistance. Just because the envelope is a lot more diverse than any other part of the virus. Given the role of capsid in the multiple steps of viral infection, over here, um, and given the uh, success with lenacapavir, what's the general enthusiasm in applying this strategy to other emerging viruses? Sorry, are you asking about the other viruses Just, uh, what, beyond? Can you generalize the capsid strategy to other Oh, to other viruses. Vi I know at least one virus where it works, and that's hepatitis B, right? Hepatitis B is sort of a pseudo-retrovirus. It also runs the reverse transcription step, and it also forms the capsid through this polymerization. And there are some super potent uh, inhibitors of the HBV capsid formation, which I think work in a very similar principle. So I would say, yes, you can actually uh, the generalize this principle to other viruses as well. Thanks very much.
Um, it, it's now my pleasure to introduce our, our second speaker, uh, David Liu. David Liu is one of the few people you can introduce with a one sentence introduction. He just a, a, an incredibly amazing person. Um, Dave, Dave was um, an undergraduate at Harvard, um, graduated at the top of his Harvard class. I was lucky enough to recruit him in my career as a graduate student, and he actually started our whole uh, expanded genetic code effort, creating the very clever selections we used. Um, Dave then um, decided not to postdoc, started his career at Berkeley, uh, at Harvard directly, um, rose up through the ranks quickly. Uh, he's now the Richard Merkin um, Professor and Director of the, the Merkin Institute for Transformative Technologies at the Broad. He's also on the faculty at Harvard in the Harvard Chemistry Department as a Cabot Professor of Natural Sciences. And he's also uh, an HHMI investigator. Um, Dave's research really focuses on using chemistry, chemical design, um, protein engineering and molecular evolution methods to create proteins with really amazing um, properties. He started um, looking, um, was really led the, the DNA templated synthesis of diverse chemical libraries um, that, that became a really useful tool for drug discovery. He also was, was the first person to realize the importance of doing continuous um, evolution and invented a, a, a phage-based method to do that called PACE, and that's been applied to, to many problems uh, in, in, in biochemistry and, and protein chemistry. Uh, the thing that he's probably best known for now is base editing. Uh, and most recently, prime editing, where you can basically turn any base and DNA selectively into another base, delete it, or perform an insertion. Um, and it, you do that without double strand breaks. So it, it's incredibly powerful. And, and, and I would argue it's probably, you know, going to transform, if any technology is going to transform medicine at the level of manipulating the human genome. It's prime editing. Um, Dave has won many awards. Uh, I'll mention um, two. He won the Levinson Award um, for teaching um, at Harvard, which is impressive. Um, and he also just won the King Faisal uh, uh, Prize in Medicine. He was also named uh, Nature 10 Top Researchers, okay, in the world. Um, he started, I think at last count it was 10 companies, Dave, maybe in the last couple of weeks it's up to 12, <laughs> okay. Um, all incredibly successful, um, so successful that Dave donates his exorbitant salary at the Broad to his coworkers, which explains why I can never recruit a graduate student when they want to work for Dave, too, okay? <laughs> but, um, Dave um, is, is, not only does he do science incredibly well, but, but he does many other things. Uh, incredibly well. He can talk about almost anything at any level from samurai sw swords to uh, uh, he's, he's been banned from many casinos in Las Vegas um, uh, from the blackjack tables, okay. Uh, and he does amazing card tricks uh, that hopefully he'll show a few people tonight. Um, so the, the only thing I, I've noticed that he really can't do is drive a snowmobile through the snow, <laughs> okay? He always seems to get them stuck. But anyway, um, Dave's lecture today is a long title, but it's really about base editing. So, Dave. Uh, well, thank you. It's... it's uh, 
incredible uh, pleasure to be part of this uh, event uh, uh, to honor John Martin. And uh, I can see f not only from his reputation, but from the work we just heard, the kind of legacy that he's left and uh, feel like we all have such big shoes to fill to, to live, up, live up to that impact on human health. Uh, here are my disclosures, uh, which Pete already summarized in detail, um, the most relevant of which is that I'm uh, a founder or co-founder of gene editing companies, including Beam Therapeutics and Prime Medicine. Um, gene editing is really just uh, highly regioselective chemistry on DNA within the constraints of a living cell. And so in this talk, I'll describe how um, nucleases, uh, base editors, and prime editors uh, catalyze their respective chemistries and how mammalian cells respond to each, and how gene editing agents have been paired with macromolecular delivery methods, another field that's uh, really ripe for innovation through chemistry and chemical biology, to enable some of the first therapeutic uh, human gene editing applications and uh, clinical trials. The mutations that uh, that uh, occur in our genome cause thousands of genetic diseases, at least 6,800 by recent count, that together afflict hundreds of millions of people. So a longstanding goal of the life sciences has therefore been to develop the ability to install, correct, or otherwise modify all types of pathogenic mutations so that we can study or treat the broadest possible range of the corresponding diseases. Thanks to the pioneering work of many scientists, some of whom are listed at the bottom of the slide, programmable nucleases, such as zinc finger nucleases, talons, and of course CRISPR-Cas9, really initiated the modern era of gene editing by enabling efficient targeted gene disruption or deletion. Programmable nucleases excel at disrupting genes. Uh, this is, after all, exactly what CRISPR-Cas9 evolved in nature to do because the primary response to cutting the DNA double helix in most types of cells is to initiate end joining repair processes that re, uh, rejoin the broken ends of the cut chromosome. Now, most of these end joining events uh, are perfect. They perfectly repair the cut DNA, regenerating the starting sequence. But since a perfectly regenerated starting sequence can simply be cut again by the same nuclease, the cycle of cutting and end joining occurs over and over again until the end joining makes a mistake, which is usually the deletion or the addition of a small number of nucleotides. These end joining errors accumulate until the DNA sequence is different enough from the starting sequence that the nuclease can no longer recognize it. In other words, these are dead end products. So that's really how we get indels, mixtures of insertions and deletions that unfortunately we can't control, but that usually disrupt the function of a coding or a regulatory sequence. Now, disrupting genes can be very useful, both for basic science research and for some therapeutic applications. For example, Cas9 nuclease has been used in a clinical trial to disrupt the gene that makes too much of a protein that causes transthyretin amyloidosis, resulting in the sharp decrease uh, in the serum levels of the protein that causes the disease. Likewise, Cas9 nucleus has been used to disrupt a regulatory sequence that silences your fetal hemoglobin genes around the time that you're born. Uh, disrupting this regulatory sequence allows uh, fetal hemoglobin expression to reawaken, and that can compensate for defective adult hemoglobin genes in patients with sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia. More than 200 patients to date, including uh, Victoria, Patrick, and Carlene, pictured here, have been treated in clinical trials with CRISPR nucleases targeting DNA sequences that, when disrupted, offer clinical benefit. The fact that the same basic type of DNA cutting uh, enzyme can be reprogrammed with different guide RNAs to treat diseases as diverse uh, and as serious as sickle cell disease, uh, amyloidosis, and genetic vision loss offers a really exciting glimpse into the era of therapeutic human gene editing, which is an era that has already begun. 
Most genetic diseases, however, arise from mutations that have caused genes to lose their function, and therefore they can't really be rescued by further disrupting a gene. Most disease-causing mutations, in other words, require precise gene correction rather than gene disruption to best benefit patients. And using programmable nucleases to precisely correct mutated genes in most therapeutic settings remains very challenging. Nucleases alone, of course, merely catalyze phosphodiester bond cleavage and do not have the ability to make a specified change in DNA sequence. In the presence of a donor DNA template, uh, some foundational work by Maria Jason and others established that double-strand DNA breaks can also stimulate homology-directed repair, or HDR, which can correct pathogenic alleles. Unfortunately, the inefficiency of HDR in most cell types, especially non-dividing cells like the cells that occur in, in the vast majority of your body, as well as the challenges associated with double-strand breaks and donor DNA template delivery, have thus far really limited the therapeutic relevance of HDR. Double-strand breaks are now well appreciated to induce other undesirable responses, such as chromosomal abnormalities, large deletion, and p53 activation that can enrich oncogenic or pre-oncogenic cells. And as a result, uh, clinical trials of gene editing nucleases, there are more than 50 uh, right now, have overwhelmingly been limited to those indications for which gene disruption or deletion can be therapeutic, rather than the much larger set of indications that could be addressed in principle by precise gene correction. So to enable efficient and precise gene correction in a wide variety of cell types, we developed base editing and prime editing. Base editors are shown here. They use the targeting mechanism of programmable DNA binding proteins, such as disabled uh, CRISPR nucleases or zinc finger arrays or tail arrays to engage a DNA sequence of your choosing. But instead of cutting the DNA, they use deaminase enzymes, either taken from nature or evolved in our laboratory, to directly convert one target base to another. And then they guide the cell through the DNA repair processes that are needed to make this conversion permanent on both DNA strands. Cytosine-based editors convert C to T or G to A, while adenine-based editors convert A to G or T to C. Nature actually doesn't provide an enzyme, at least that we know of, that can perform the deamination of deoxyadenosine. So we actually evolved in our laboratory the first known and still the only known family of deoxyadenosine deaminases in order to uh, make uh, adenine-based editing possible. We also develop CRISPR-free all-protein-based editors that use tail arrays or zinc finger arrays to target DNA enabling the first purposeful changes in the DNA sequence of mitochondria and chloroplasts in living cells and in animals. It had not been previously possible to precisely edit mitochondrial DNA sequences simply because of the lack of a known mechanism to get guide RNAs and therefore CRISPR systems into mitochondria in functional form. Many labs have now used, used base editors, both uh, ex vivo and in vivo, to address animal models of human genetic disease. Uh, sickle cell disease is the most common deadly monogenic disorder worldwide, and it's caused by an A to T mutation in HBB, the beta globin genes. While base editing cannot reverse an A to T mutation, an adenine base editor can convert this pathogenic valine codon to a benign alanine codon, which results in a naturally occurring hemoglobin variant called hemoglobin Macassar. We evolved a bespoke base editor that uses a, a PACE-evolved Cas9 domain in work that was led by Shannon Miller, who's now at Scripps, uh, to recognize a, a CACC PAM uh, that is needed to optimally position the base editor at this locus, and a PACE-evolved deaminase domain uh, that has very high activity. And in collaboration with Mitch Weiss's lab, we use the resulting base editor to edit human sickle cell patient hematopoietic stem cells ex vivo, achieving 80% average conversion of uh, the sickle allele to the benign hemoglobin allele. And then if you transplant these edited human sickle cell patient hematopoietic stem cells into irradiated mice, the vast majority of the blood cell lineages are edited. And as a result, the frequency of 
sickling in red blood cells from these transplanted mice is sharply reduced, as you can see here. And we repeated this experiment by editing and transplanting mouse hematopoietic stem cells uh, from a mouse model of sickle cell disease uh, back into mice and rescued all measured blood parameters uh, to levels that were similar to those of healthy mice uh, shown here in the purple and brown bars that are from hetero he healthy heterozygotes. Now, bone marrow is uh, perhaps unique among major organs in its ability to be taken out of your body, edited, and then put back into your body. That's not likely to occur anytime soon for, say, your heart or your brain. So for most genetic diseases, treatment through gene editing will likely require in vivo editing. And in a really exciting collaboration with the labs of uh, Francis Collins, Mike Erdos, Jonathan Brown, Leslie Gordon, and others, we used an adenine-based editor in vivo to directly reverse back to wild type the mutation that causes the rapid aging disease progeria. When we delivered the space editor into a humanized mouse model of progeria using an AAV system, we observed dramatic rescue of vascular pathology, um, as shown in these uh, aortic cross sections where the progeria mice have lost the vast majority of their vascular smooth muscle cells uh, and show this accumulation of adventitial fibrosis. The mice receiving a single injection of the base editor AAV uh, show wild type like levels at six months of uh, vascular smooth muscle nuclei and uh, virtually no adventitial fibrosis. And the median lifespan of the progeria mice receiving the single injection was also uh, greatly extended, reaching approximately the start of old age in normal mice and uh, overall achieving about a two and a half fold change, uh, extension of lifespan compared to untreated progeria mice. Untreated progeria mice live only about seven months old, by which time the mice have very thinned and whitened coats, uh, pronounced uh, kyphosis, outward curvature of the spine, and uh, very low activity levels, as you can see here. Here's a video taken of three uh, adenine base editor injected females, injected once. These, uh, this video was taken when these females were 11 months old. Uh, and even though they have the same progeria genotype as the untreated male you saw earlier, uh, you can see that they have uh, very few symptoms and they are already are already, at the time of this video, uh, was taken, living much longer than any untreated progeria mice uh, can survive. Uh, and likewise, here are three uh, adenine base editor injected male progeria mice plus one wild type C57 black mouse here, the slightly larger mouse. Uh, and again, you can see that they have healthy coats, no obvious kyphosis, and also very high activity levels. So we're hopeful that these results collectively provide a foundation to bring to progeria patients the benefits of directly correcting the mutation that drives their disease. And we're currently working with the NIH and the Progeria Research Foundation and other collaborators uh, to do so. Okay, a few weeks ago, we reported a therapeutic gene editing strategy to treat spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, the leading genetic cause of infant mortality worldwide. Uh, SMA is the consequence of two genetic accidents. Uh, first, SMA patients all have homozygous loss of function or deletion mutations in their SMN1 genes, which encode this essential SMN protein. Um, now, in animals, the loss of SMN1 genes results in a failure to complete embryogenesis. So animals actually don't get SMA. But the second genetic accident is humans, all of us, uniquely have an imperfectly duplicated copy of SMN1 called SMN2, which differs from SMN1 in a single C to T mutation. SMN2 makes this defective, short-lived copy of SMN protein, thanks to a, a missplicing event, that is insufficient to support motor neuron survival, but it is sufficient to allow SMA babies to be born, only to suffer from progressive loss of motor function and untreated, the vast majority will uh, not see their second birthdays. Uh, there are three FDA-approved SMA drugs that have collectively uh, revolutionized the treatment for thousands of SMA patients. They are uh, the antisense oligonucleotide uh, nusinersen, the small molecule splicing inhibitor, risdiplam, and an SMN-expressing AAV9 called Zolgenzima. 
Uh, but these drugs do not um, fully restore SMN protein levels. They don't allow endogenous regulation of SMN, which is known to be important biologically. And they require repeated administration, or in the case of the AAV gene therapy, uh, we expect that the therapeutic uh, benefit will wane over time, but it's not clear how those patients can be redosed. So uh, we decided to try to develop a one-time gene editing treatment for SMA, and we made the decision early on that rather than trying to correct SMN1 mutations, which can vary by SMN patient, uh, and most SMA patients actually don't even have SMN1 genes, they've been deleted, so there's nothing to edit. Instead, we targeted SMN2, that imperfect SMN1 duplication that we know all SMA patients must have because if they didn't have it, they wouldn't be born. So we tested more than 70 nuclease and base editing strategies targeting SMN2 that we thought might result in increased SMN protein levels. And for each strategy, we used uh, machine learning models that we previously developed called Indelphi or Beehive to predict editing outcomes. And then we used experiments in cells from SMA mice that contain human SMN2 copies and lack mouse SMN uh, to test the effectiveness of each of these gene editing strategies and their ability in particular to rescue the production of SMN protein. And shown here are 35 nuclease strategies that each use different Cas9 nuclease variants to cut DNA sequences that we hypothesized might increase SMN protein levels when disrupted with indels. And the most effective of these 35 nuclease editing strategies indeed increased SMN proteins by as much as about 17-fold. However, SMN proteins are about 40-fold lower in these SMA cells than in normal cells. So even the best nuclease editing strategies we identified did not fully restore SMN protein levels, in addition to generating the mixture of indel byproducts and the other downsides of editing through double-strand breaks. So we also tested 42 different base editing strategies. <clears throat> 19 base editing strategies shown in this slide all sought the same goal, which is to convert SMN2 directly into a healthy copy of SMN1 by correcting that C to T mutation that occurred during SMN1's imperfect duplication during human evolution. The most effective of these base editing strategies fully restored SMN protein levels, uh, uh, so about 40-fold uh, to wild-type-like levels, and uh, although not shown here, fully restored exon 7 splicing. We packaged the most promising of these uh, adenine base editor strategies uh, into a dual AAV9 vector and injected ICV, so injected directly into the brain, uh, neonatal SMA mice uh, that, again, lack SMN1 genes and instead have human SMN2 genes. And we observed a very efficient transduction of uh, tissues in the central nervous system consistent with AAV9's known tropisms. Uh, shown here, we're getting 43% trans uh, 43 transduction of spinal motor neurons. And in the mouse CNS, um, the chosen base editor efficiently converted SMN2 to SMN1 in 87% of transduced cells, about 40% of bulk uh, cells assayed. We also uh, then started assessing uh, the impact of these base editors on motor function, starting with electrophysiology measurements. Uh, motor unit number estimation, or MUNI, is a measurement of motor neuron functional integrity. And we observed significant improvements for the mice receiving the base editor, such that the MUNI measurements of these uh, base edited mice were similar to those of healthy mice. And in contrast, neither daily rizdiplam nor an ICV injection of Zolgensma rescued Mooney levels to the same extent we observed from base editing. Now, when we looked at the animal's lifespan, uh, we were initially disappointed when uh, adenine base editor treatment only modestly extended SMA mouse lifespan. But then we realized that uh, SMA mice have an unusually short time window for treatment. Uh, of about only six days for correction before the fate of motor neurons is sealed. And that very short window likely limited the ability of base editing to actually exert a therapeutic benefit because we've known from our previous work, such as the progeria work I showed you, that AEV delivery of base editors typically takes maybe one to three weeks for most of the base editing to take place. 
Now, in human patients, the window for treatment that benefits SMA patients is much longer, up to about one year. So we then put all this together and, and uh, speculated that a simple co-administration of a single dose of nusinersen, the SMA antisense oligonucleotide, along with the base editor AAV would likely extend this therapeutic window to give the base editor a greater opportunity to correct uh, uh, the, the mutation and would also uh, more closely resemble the state of SMA patients in a clinical trial since we presume all of them are gonna be on one of these SMA drugs. And indeed, the one-time co-administration in vivo of nusinersen and the base editor together as a combination therapy greatly extended animal lifespan from a median of 17 days untreated to now a median of 77 days, along with substantial rescue of motor function in behavioral assays, such as how long can you hang on to an inverted screen, or the time that the mouse needs to right itself from being uh, laid on its back. So here's a video of a writing reflex assay for an untreated SMA mouse at, uh, 11, at 14 days of age. And you can see that uh, these mice struggle to, to write themselves uh, when you lay them on their back, and some of them uh, will never write themselves. In contrast, uh, here are videos of uh, adenine base editor treated SMA mice at 14 days of age, also showing substantial rescue of uh, the writing ability. And in the lower right, this is an example of an SMA mouse co injected once with the adenine base editor and nusinersen at 200 days old. Uh, well beyond the median lifespan of this SMA mouse model, even following early intervention with Solgensma, as well as, uh, for comparison, a healthy heterozygous uh, litter mate shown in the upper right here. Now, the beautiful work of many scientists and other academic labs and in industry have advanced base editing into primates and then into clinical trials. Uh, Kieran Musunura's group and scientists at Verve Therapeutics and Beam Therapeutics recently reported the one-time LMP-mediated uh, delivery of adenine base editor mRNA, uh, not unlike the COVID vaccine that you guys got, into the liver of non-human primates, resulting in precise mutation of the PCSK9 splice site. Even though their goal was to simply lower PCSK9 levels, and therefore they could in principle do so by disrupting PCSK9 using a nuclease, they actually compared side by side Cas9 nuclease and base editors and chose base editors due to their observation of both higher efficacy and fewer undesired outcomes. So the LMP-mediated ABE delivery durably reduced, permanently reduced PCSK9 levels in monkeys by 90% and consequently uh, cut LDL cholesterol levels by 60% to treat hypercholesterolemia. So this is a one-time permanent uh, injection that uh, lowers LDL cholesterol by almost two-thirds. Uh, there are four base editing clinical trials, at least, that are now underway in four countries. Uh, last spring, Wasim Kwasim's team um, at the UCL in the UK treated the very first patient in a base editing clinical trial using multiplex base edited CAR T cells to treat T cell leukemia. In late 2021, FDA granted uh, IND clearance for the first US uh, base editing clinical trial, which uses an adenine base editor to install naturally occurring mutations in fetal hemoglobin genes that uh, uh, restore fetal hemoglobin uh, expression, first discovered through human genetics because there are some people who uh, should have beta thalassemia or sickle cell disease but don't because despite their homozygous uh, defective beta globin genes, they happen to have won the genetic lottery and, and uh, have additional mutations in their fetal hemoglobin that allow persistence of fetal hemoglobin expression. And in late uh, 2022, the first patients were dosed in an in vivo base editing clinical trial. Uh, that's uh, the PCSK9 trial I described already uh, in monkeys to treat familiar hypercholesterolemia. So this very rapid progress, uh, where it was only about six years from the very first base editing report to the first use in people, uh, is a testament to the work of thousands of laboratories that have used an advanced base editing uh, resulting in thousands of publications uh, that include base editing. So last December, the, the very first clinical readout from a base editing therapeutic was announced. Uh, this is Alyssa, a then 13-year-old girl in the UK with T-cell leukemia. And she was given a very poor prognosis after both chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant uh, failed to treat her cancer. She was infused with CAR T-cells that 
were triply base edited. They contained uh, base edits in CD7, CD52, and the T cell receptor. Collectively, these edits enabled uh, the, the CAR T cells to go after uh, Alyssa's cancer without going after her healthy cells and also not committing fratricide, not killing each other, because after all, these are T cells. Uh, and following uh, treatment with the triply base edited T cells, Alyssa's uh, T cell leukemia went into complete remission. And as of this month, almost one year after treatment, her cancer remains undetected. And Wasim's team has actually treated other T cell leukemia patients in this trial as well with uh, positive outcomes. So base editors can make targeted transition mutations in cells, animals, and patients. But what about pathogenic mutations other than transition mutations? These other mutations, the transversions, deletions, insertions, account for about 70% of known pathogenic gene variants. So we sought to develop other methods to directly install or correct these other kinds of changes, again, without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. So to enable precise gene editing beyond the mutations that can be installed by base editing, we developed prime editing. Prime editors are fusions of programmable NICases with specially engineered reverse transcriptases. They use an engineered prime editing guide RNA, or PEG RNA for short, shown in green here, that not only specifies the target site for editing, but it also encodes uh, the desired edit. Prime, editing, uh, prime editors nick the target DNA site, and then they use the three prime end of the freshly nicked DNA strand to prime reverse transcription of an extension on the PEG RNA that serves as a reverse transcriptase template and also has an engineered primer binding site to sort of line everything up. The engineered reverse transcriptase domain of the prime editor then copies the desired edit directly onto the target DNA strand, creating a three prime flap of edited DNA that the cell resolves into a heteroduplex containing one edited strand and one non-edited strand. The PE3 system then nicks the non-edited strand to cause the cell to remake that strand using the edited strand as a template, thereby completing the conversion of uh, both DNA strands uh, permanently. And since the PEG RNA's reverse transcriptase template here, which encodes the edit, uh, is specified by you, you can make virtually any small substitution, insertion, or deletion using this strategy. Um, currently, the size limit for state-of-the-art prime editing systems is about a couple hundred base pairs for an insertion uh, and uh, several hundred base pairs for a deletion. A hallmark of prime editing is this remarkable versatility. So you can now perform uh, for the first time, at least when we reported this for the first time, all 12 possible types of DNA substitutions as well as precise targeted deletions and precise insertions for the first time in mammalian cells without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. More than 95% of known pathogenic substitutions, insertions, and deletions are fewer than 50 base pairs in length and thus are well within the size range for installation or correction with prime editing. An important aspect of prime editing is that its edited products tend to be quite homogeneous. In the examples shown here, uh, prime editing can install this three base insertion in the human genome at a target site. And as you can see here, the vast majority of the resulting edited DNA sequences has the desired correction. The slide actually shows all of the DNA sequences, uh, sequencing reads that were observed at 0.2% or greater frequency. In contrast, you can use a Cas9 nuclease and an HDR template to install in the same cells the exact same insertion. And in cells that do support HDR, like the K562 cells on the right, you can get reasonably efficient HDR. But in both cases, whether the cells are HDR amenable or not, the predominant uh, product are, are these uncontrolled mixtures of indels, which are usually lumped into one percent nuclease editing bar, but are actually a mixture of genotypes that can each have different biological consequences. Previous uh, CRISPR-based editing methods derive their DNA specificity primarily from a single DNA guide RNA hybridization event. In contrast, prime editing actually requires three semi-independent DNA hybridization events in order for prime editing to take place productively. Uh, you need to hybridize the PEG RNA to the target DNA site. You need to hybridize the reverse transcribed, um, uh, uh, sorry, you need to hybridize the uh, 
the freshly nicked target DNA strand to the primer binding site of the PEG RNA, and you need to hybridize the uh, reverse transcribed three prime flap onto the unedited strand of DNA. And since each of these three hybridization events provides an opportunity to reject a mismatched off-target sequence, we wondered if prime editing might uh, offer lower off-target editing levels than, for example, Cas9 nuclease that does not have all three of these checks. And indeed, we examined 16 known off-target sites in the human genome for these four previously characterized on-target guide RNAs. And when we did a side-by-side -side comparison of editing efficiencies of Cas9 nuclease versus prime editors at these off-target sites using the same PEG RNAs to program both the nucleases and the base editors, we saw that uh, prime editing uh, showed much lower off-target editing uh, than uh, Cas9 nuclease for all of these off-target sites. And other labs in uh, papers cited at the bottom of this slide have also investigated not just off-target prime editing, but alterations of telomeres, uh, changes to endogenous genomic retrotransposons, alterations of uh, splicing patterns, uh, altered gene expression, using a variety of methods, including single cell uh, whole genome and whole transcriptome analysis, and have found uh, prime editing to be highly specific for the target sequence, with no observations yet reported of undesired prime editing consequences beyond uh, the rare type of off-target uh, editing events uh, shown here. Our labs and several others have recently reported the use of two PEG RNAs to install both DNA uh, strands, edited DNA strands simultaneously, thereby obviating the need for the cell to perform second strand synthesis. Uh, we call this method twin prime editing, uh, which we named after the twin prime paradox, but apparently nobody cared <laughs> because nobody got that. Uh, it's an especially efficient way to uh, perform prime editing of larger DNA sequences, such as uh, the insertion of these uh, roughly 50 base pair at P or at B landing sites for BX, B1 recombinase. And you can probably see what's coming next. Now you can uh, use twin prime editing to install a BX, B1 recombinase landing site, and then use BX, B1 recombinase either in a two-step process or in a single transfection process to knock in large multi-kilobase gene-sized DNA at targeted sites of our choosing in the human genome, including at safe harbor loci, or at the sites of pathogenic gene loss. And by enabling uh, RNA programmed site-specific insertion of gene-sized DNA in mammalian cells, we're hopeful that this type of strategy might be used to address one of the biggest challenges in therapeutic gene editing, which is that um, most genetic diseases are not like sickle cell disease or progeria, where uh, almost every patient in the case of progeria, and by definition, every patient in the case of sickle cell disease has the same mutation. Most genetic diseases are made of patient subpopulations that are divided into dozens or hundreds of different mutations. And it's challenging to imagine how you could develop a different uh, editing agent drug for each of those mutations. So the best you could probably do if you take that approach is go after diseases where there are significant patient populations that are represented by individual mutations. But if you can install the healthy copy of a gene and the disease is a loss of function, in principle, you could install that healthy copy of the gene at the endogenous locus. So it should be ideally under native endogenous gene regulatory mechanisms uh, and rescue um, all patient cohorts that suffer from loss of function mutations, regardless of what their mutation is, not unlike what we did with the SMA mice. Okay, to develop improved prime editing systems, which has been a focus of the lab for the past few years, uh, we sought to understand the cellular determinants of prime editing outcomes. And in a collaboration with Professor Britt Adamson at Princeton and Dr. Jeff Hussman in Jonathan Weissman's lab, we used their RepairSeq CRISPR eye screening platform to knock down each of several hundred DNA repair genes in human cells and then measured quantitatively how each perturbation affected prime editing outcomes at a target site that we installed right next to the CRISPR eye guide RNA. So this setup allows the guide RNA and the target site to be read out in a single high throughput sequencing read. Uh, and the strongest single family of hits from this screen were all components of the DNA mismatch repair system. And knocking down these genes, shown in blue, strongly increased prime editing efficiencies, 
and decreased the frequency of undesired indel byproducts. Now these findings support the models shown here for the role of mismatch repair during prime editing. In eukaryotes, mismatch repair resolves DNA heteroduplexes, disagreements between the Watson and Crick strands, by selectively replacing the nicked DNA strands. Since an early intermediate in prime editing is a heteroduplex in which the freshly reversed transcribed strand containing the edit by definition must be nicked, mismatch repair acting on this intermediate before uh, the edited strand can be ligated will likely revert the edit and regenerate the original sequence. So we wondered if we could transiently inhibit or evade mismatch repair during prime editing uh, to enhance prime editing efficiency by allowing this ligation of the NIC a greater opportunity to take place before the heteroduplex can be reverted by mismatch repair. Once ligated, the heteroduplex now lacks any cue to direct mismatch repair as to which strand is at fault, and therefore would be expected to be resolved with roughly equal probability into the edited or the unedited sequence. And of course, in the PE3 systems, we nick the non-edited bottom strand in this cartoon, and that actually biases mismatch repair to, to uh, favor giving us the edited product. Now, to test this hypothesis, we first engineered a dominant negative MLH1 protein that we called uh, MLH1DN, uncreatively. Uh, if you transiently co-express MLH1DN with uh, uh, our, either our PE2 system or a PE3 system, uh, you get much higher efficiencies uh, as well as fewer indel byproducts. So we call the combination of PE2 with the mismatch repair dominant negative uh, protein PE4, and likewise the combination of PE3 with MLH1DN we call PE5. Uh, we observe these benefits in many types of cells, including these uh, patient-derived iPSCs in which uh, PE5 efficiently corrected a single base deletion that caused a little girl's uh, CDKL5 deficiency disorder. But what if you don't want, or you can't, perturb mismatch repair during prime editing? You can still use these basic science discoveries because mismatch repair is known to operate primarily on heteroduplexes with small numbers of mispaired bases, one mismatch or two mismatches. We exploited this fact to realize the benefits of MLH1DN, but without having to perturb mismatch repair at all by carefully designing our prime edits to purposefully install additional benign or silent mutations near the target edit so that prime editing intermediates would natively evade mismatch repair because the MMR machinery does not look at such a grossly mismatched intermediate as a mismatch. And indeed, we observe that somewhat counterintuitively, it's actually easier to prime edit to generate multiple edits than it is to generate a single edit because the additional silent or benign mutations near the target edit uh, allow that intermediate to naturally evade mismatch repair. And we now routinely use this strategy to design virtually all of our PEG RNAs, uh, which has uh, substantially benefited prime editing efficiencies. And this advance really just came entirely from achieving a deeper basic science understanding of how prime editing works and how the cell responds to it. And then finally, we optimized uh, codon usage, Cas9 sequences, linker sequences, nuclear localization sequences to generate an optimized prime editing protein architecture that we call PEMAX. And in work I don't have time to present in detail, we also discovered that if you append the critical three prime extension of PEG RNAs with certain RNA pseudonauts, uh, you end up with engineered PEG RNAs, EPEG RNAs as we call them, that resist cellular degradation, which turns out to be another bottleneck that previously limited prime editing efficiencies, especially in vivo. And when you combine all these improvements, uh, mismatch repair evasion, the PE max protein architecture, and engineered PEG RNAs, we observe this large cumulative benefit consistent with their independent mechanisms so that our current prime editing systems with EPEG RNAs outperform our original prime editing systems on average by more than an order of magnitude, both in editing efficiency and in the ratios of edits, desired edit to indels. And these advancements have really had a profound impact on our ability to make challenging therapeutic edits, especially in mismatch repair competent cells that used to be poorly edited. It was just sort of a happy coincidence that we developed prime editing in HEC293T cells, which are naturally MMR 
partially MMR suppressed because of a DNA methylation uh, uh, change. Um, and it's tempting to speculate that if we had chosen a cell type to develop prime editing in which mismatch repair was uh, highly active, we may have never actually uh, gotten there. So here are three such examples, all of which uh, started at low single digit percentage prime editing, but thanks to uh, all of the improvements I've talked about can now be edited at potentially therapeutically relevant levels. And in new work I didn't get a chance to present today, we've also used our PACE system to evolve new PE6 prime editor proteins that further increase prime editing efficiencies and also extend the length uh, of prime edits. The ability of prime editing to precisely replace one stretch of DNA with another in a living human cell raises the possibility of correcting the root cause of trinucleotide repeat disorders. Uh, in some exciting uh, new data, still unpublished, we have used prime editing to precisely edit trinucleotide repeats that cause Huntington's disease and Friedrich's ataxia in mouse embryonic stem cells, in Friedrich's ataxia patient fibroblasts, and in vivo in mouse models of both diseases. For both targets, the enhanced prime editing systems I described in this talk can precisely replace larger numbers of repeats at pathogenic loci with non-pathogenic smaller numbers of repeats efficiently and with uh, minimal indel byproducts. Researchers have recently described in vivo prime editing using a variety of viral and non-viral delivery methods. Uh, for example, in work that's publishing uh, Tomorrow? Tomorrow? Uh, our lab achieved in vivo prime editing using uh, iteratively engineered split AAV systems, resulting in therapeutically relevant levels of prime editing in the mouse brain or liver, as well as uh, significant prime editing in the bulk heart. And uh, recent papers have achieved in vivo prime editing in animal models of human genetic disease. For example, Kai Yao's group uh, recently reported the use of AAV delivered prime editing to rescue retinal degeneration. Uh, in a mouse model of retinitis pigmentosa. And Gerald Schwenk's lab uh, used adenoviral delivery of prime editors to rescue uh, phenylketonuria in mice. In a study we published last week, we used uh, prime editing of sickle cell disease patient uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells to efficiently correct the sickle cell disease. Now back to wild type beta globin because prime editing can make the T to A transversion that's needed to actually convert the sickle allele back to wild type beta globin. And we showed that this can rescue sickle cell disease phenotypes in mice. So 17 weeks after transplantation into immunodeficient mice, uh, prime edited sickle cell disease uh, hematopoietic stem cells showed engraftment frequencies, uh, hematopoietic differentiation, and lineage maturation, not all of which is shown here, that were uh, indistinguishable from those of unedited uh, hematopoietic stem cells from healthy donors, indicating that prime editing did not impair hematopoietic stem cell engraftment or differentiation. An average of 42% of human red blood cells isolated 17 weeks after transplantation of prime edited hematopoietic stem cells into mice uh, showed uh, expression of wild type beta globin exceeding the threshold of about 20% that's thought to confer therapeutic benefit. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the red blood cells uh, from the mice that received the transplanted, prime edited uh, sickle cell patient hematopoietic stem cells uh, carried less sickle hemoglobin and resisted hypoxia induced sickling, uh, shown here. Uh, as we hoped, we detected virtually no off target editing at over 100 sites that were nominated by an unbiased experimental genome wide uh, off target detection method. So while there are several, uh, several may even be an understatement, many distinct gene therapy and gene editing approaches to treating sickle cell disease that are currently being pursued, uh, these findings suggest the feasibility of a one-time prime editing treatment that offers a unique combination of reverting the pathogenic allele back to the wild type beta globin without requiring any viral or non-viral DNA templates which can harm uh, engraftment uh, efficiency and also minimizes the undesired consequences of uh, DNA double strand breaks. As is already apparent from what I've presented, the delivery of proteins into animals and human patients remains a major challenge that limits the impact of gene editing and more broadly of macromolecular therapeutics in general. So I'll end this talk with a brief summary of an in vivo gene editing protein delivery platform that uh, I'm particularly excited about. While viral and non-viral 
uh, approaches each have their strengths and weaknesses for the delivery of gene editing agents, uh, we became particularly interested in virus-like particles. These are basically non-infectious viruses based on retroviruses, like what you heard in uh, Tomas's presentation. Uh, but the viral nucleic acid has been replaced by cargo, ideally cargo protein, and they offer, in theory, some of the best advantages of both viral and non-viral delivery approaches. VLPs can efficiently transduce mammalian cells, in cell culture at least, with specific tissue tropisms that are a function of the glycoproteins that are on the outside of these VLPs, and with no risk of oncogenic DNA integration because there's no viral nucleic acid uh, in, there's no DNA at all in, in the VLPs. Um, they can deliver a one-time dose of a protein or an RNA that's short-lived. Ideally, uh, for maximizing the DNA specificity of gene editing agents, because gene editing is not equilibrium chemistry. Uh, there's only one or two substrate molecules in every cell. So the on-targets get edited most quickly, and then once the on-targets have been edited, the only thing left in the cell is off-target. So what that means is the shorter you expose the cell to a gene editing agent, as long as you've given it enough time to perform the on-target edit that you wish to make, uh, the higher the specificity because it won't have as much of an opportunity to edit off-target sites. The challenge with VLPs has been that they've shown low efficacy in vivo, especially for protein delivery, despite the beautiful work of labs like Emiliano Ricci's lab and Jennifer Doudna's lab, who showed that VLPs can deliver Cas9 nuclease efficiently in cultured cells. But when we used these canonical, what we call version one VLP architectures to deliver current generation base editors, we could achieve very high levels of delivery and editing in cultured cells, but very poor delivery when we injected the same uh, base editor VLPs into animals. So um, we systematically identified and engineered solutions to three major bottlenecks, which turned out to be cargo release, cargo packaging and localization, and VLP component stoichiometry that reduce the potency of VLP-mediated protein delivery, especially in vivo. And to summarize uh, three years of work uh, from Samagia and Aditya in one slide, uh, we engineered protease cleavable linkers that are cleaved fast enough to allow efficient cargo release in transduced cells, but are slow enough that the cargo is not cleaved prematurely before it can be efficiently packaged into the VLPs because the cargo can only be packaged from the cytoplasm. Uh, we also solved the paradox of the cargo needing to be in the cytoplasm to be packaged, but in the nucleus to edit genes, where the DNA is, by placing nuclear export signals on the virus side of the cleavable linker and nuclear localization signals on the cargo side. So as a result, the cargo can remain in the cytoplasm long enough to enable efficient packaging, but once it's cleaved from the VLP, it can, it's free to enter the nucleus. And finally, we varied the stoichiometry of the viral proteins versus the cargo to find an optimal balance between the protease, other viral proteins, and cargo levels that uh, best promotes efficacious delivery. And when we combine all of these improvements, um, we obtained fourth generation engineered VLPs, or version four EVLPs as we call them, which mediate much more potent delivery of base editors and Cas9 nuclease into mammalian cells, shown here first in cell culture, uh, and if you swap the envelope glycoprotein of these EVLPs um, from VSVG to other alternatives, you uh, observe the corresponding uh, alteration of cell type preference of the EVLPs. And consistent with the DNA-free nature of EVLPs, we did not detect any cargo encoding DNA in cells treated with EVLPs, unlike cells transfected with plasmids or with, with DNA viruses suggesting that EVLP should carry minimal risk of oncogenic gene integration. Now, how do they work in vivo? Well, in contrast with the version one VLPs shown here, these engineered VLPs efficiently deliver base editor RNPs, protein RNA complexes, into tissues in vivo. So a single systemic injection of EVLPs uh, containing base editor protein that's, uh, that is programmed to edit the PCSK9 gene that's in that clinical trial, uh, uh, resulted in 63% average editing of bulk liver, which is 26-fold more efficient than the version 1 VLPs. And at 63% editing of bulk liver in a mouse, you've basically edited all the hepatocytes. Uh, and uh, as a result, you get, in this case, about 80% knockdown of serum PCSK9 protein levels 
but with no elevated ALT or AST liver enzymes, unlike the use of LMPs, and uh, no liver histology changes. Um, we also uh, injected EVLP subretinally into a mouse model of genetic blindness caused by a premature stop codon in RP65, and showed that injection, this time into adult mice, of an EVLP delivering an adenine base editor protein uh, into uh, the mouse, uh, again, um, can directly correct this mutation back to wild type, rescuing full length protein production and uh, visual function, uh, which you can see a partial rescue of in, in the animal uh, as measured by these lecturo uh, retinograms. Uh, but the real hope is that uh, because VLPs are delivering gene editing agents in their most transient form as proteins, that they should show substantially lower off-target editing. And indeed, when we explicitly measure off-target editing at known off-target sites for this base editor and guide RNA, we observe off-target editing following viral treatment, this in this case with an AAV, but not following EVLP treatment, even though the on-target editing is comparable for both methods. Okay, so I'll end with a summary of the three classes of gene editing technologies uh, that are programmable and function robustly in mammalian cells. Uh, that is um, nucleases, base editors, and prime editors. Nucleases can efficiently disrupt target sequences, uh, but they generate uncontrolled mixtures of indel byproducts and induce undesired consequences of chromosomal cleavage. Base editors efficiently um, perform the four types of transition mutations without requiring double-strand breaks, but they're vulnerable to bystander editing, which means uh, if a non-target A or C base is located right next to your target A or C base, it can be difficult to distinguish those bases. And at least the earliest version of base editors can also result in Cas-independent deamination of DNA or RNA. The later versions have KMs that are sufficiently uh, weak that they can really no longer bind DNA or RNA in the absence of, uh, of an assistance with, uh, uh, with a DNA binding protein. And prime editors can make virtually any type of local edit, again, without requiring double-strand breaks and with high DNA specificity, intrinsically high due to its mechanism. But they are newer, uh, they're larger, and therefore more difficult to deliver, and they're more complex than nucleases or base editors. All three of these technologies have now been validated in animal models of human genetic disease. The first two, as I showed you, have been validated in clinical trials. And together, they really uh, make me very hopeful that one day uh, we may no longer be so beholden to the misspellings in our DNA so that we actually have some say in our genetic fates. Okay, so to summarize, base editing enables the four transition mutations to be installed at targeted sites without requiring double-strand breaks or donor templates. And I showed you how one-time ex vivo or in vivo base editing uh, followed by uh, transplantation in the case of ex vivo editing uh, or just in vivo delivery can uh, rescue sickle cell disease, progeria, and SMA as three examples. Uh, and uh, that prime editing um, enables direct copying of DNA sequence into a chosen target DNA site, thereby enabling you to introduce a wide range of edits into human cells uh, again, without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. And that prime editing, through thinking about the mechanism and, and studying the cell's reaction to prime editors, has been substantially improved. Um, and finally, I showed you how systematic engineering of virus-like particles to overcome specific delivery bottlenecks enables uh, efficient therapeutic in vivo delivery of gene editing agents while minimizing both off-target editing uh, and avoiding the risk of oncogenic uh, DNA integration. All right, so um, not too long ago, this is actually the first time this movie has ever been shown, uh, not too long ago, the prospect of, of using laboratory engineered molecular machines to correct a specific mutation in an animal to alleviate consequences of a genetic disease really seemed like science fiction. So it's really been an incredible honor uh, to work with such an incredibly talented and dedicated group of graduate students, postdocs, and collaborators who made all this work possible. Uh, former postdoc Andrew Anzalone, now at Prime Medicine, led the development of Prime Editing. Uh, Manda Arbab, who is starting her own lab at the Harvard Medical School, and Janetta Matsuchek co-led the SMA work in collaboration with the labs of Arthur Burgess, Guan Ping Gao, uh, and others. Uh, Samagya Banskota and Aditya Raghuram uh, co-led the development of the EVLPs in collaboration with the labs of Kiran Musunuru, 
Mark Osborne and Chris Polchevsky. Uh, Peter Chen led the development of the PE4, PE5, and PE Max systems in collaboration with uh, Britt Adamson, Jeff Hussman, and Jonathan Weissman. Uh, Jesse Davis uh, led the development of AAV delivery systems for base editors and prime editors. Uh, Daniel Gao, Andrew Anzalone, and Chris Padraki co-led the development of twin prime editing and its use with recombinase enzymes to do targeted gene integration. Uh, Nicole Godelli, now at Beam Therapeutics, and Alexis Comor, now a professor at UCSD, um, led the development of our very first adenine and cytosine base editors, respectively. Luke Koblin, in uh, collaboration with Mike Erdos and Francis Collins and Jonathan Brown and Leslie Gordon, led the progeria study. Uh, Shannon Miller led the, develop, uh, led the evolution of uh, the CACC compatible Cas9 domain that we used to make the Makassar base edit. Uh, Jeanetta uh, Matuchek, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, led the prime editing of uh, the triplet repeat disease targets uh, together with Manda Arbab. Uh, Beverly Mock led the development of the, uh, the uh, mitochondrial base editors that use all proteins uh, using tail and repeat domains. Uh, tail repeat and zinc finger domains, um, together with uh, Julian, um, uh, Julian who co-led the uh, development of the zinc finger base editors. Uh, James Nelson and Peyton Randolph uh, led the development of the engineered PEG RNAs, and Greg Newby, um, Jonathan Yen, Kaylee Woodward, and Theagaraj Mayoranathan uh, led the sickle cell study in collaboration with the labs of Mitch Weiss, uh, Shandar Chai, Chandra Pruitt Miller and others. Um, Michelle Richter and Kevin Zhao co led the evolution of the ABE8E deaminase that's used for most of our uh, high efficiency base editing. And finally, I'm grateful uh, for support from all of these organizations, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks for an amazing talk, Dave. Uh, we can take questions. Uh, it's kind of hard for us to see with the lights on. Or we can just go out and get super drunk. <laughs> There's a question there. There you go. Oh. Hi. Um, back here. Sorry, I know there was a hand down there, but hi. Um, oh, howdy. Um, I just had a quick question. You know, I'm a grad student working on bioengineering problems in synthetic biology. Um, I was wondering what approach do you take when you first see a problem in bioengineering, uh, a need that can be filled? What's your first step? And if you could take us through like your initial thought process in that. Oh, it's an unusually philosophic question. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, first make sure that there's some downward sloping potential energy surface between where you start and where you want to go because otherwise it's gonna to be tough. Uh, and then, um, you know, it's, I think about problem selection. So I really try to uh, prioritize problems where either there's a very clear importance or where you have um, a strong intuitive sense that it's, it is an Im important problem. Uh, it can be very easy to convince yourself that you've chosen a really important problem or a really promising strategy. And, you know, part of, I think, maturing as a scientist is, um, is understanding when your hope is well-founded and when it's not, even though we're all sort of perpetual optimists, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what, what we do. Uh, since sort of by definition, nothing, at least in broad strokes that we try, has ever really been done before. Um, so I don't know, maybe that is an equally philosophical answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, if we could back up to the laboratory, right? A, a lot of us these days are, are using IPSC cells and we use CRISPR to do editing and it, it seems like maybe that's not the smartest thing to be doing anymore, should we be doing prime editing with uh, siRNAs or the like to the specific DNA machinery, DNA repair machineries? It seems like the efficiency goes up dramatically, so you don't have to rely as much on cloning. Is that, did I interpret that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, well, there's certainly uh, still uh, 
a lot of usefulness from using CRISPR nucleases to disrupt genes. Um, they do that very well. They are very efficient. They've been broadly studied. We know how to work with them. I, th I think it really depends on, for research purposes, is your goal to mess up a gene, in which case doing what CRISPR evolved to do, which is mess up genes, uh, is actually... But most of us want to introduce a specific mutation. Yeah, I mean, if you want to introduce life. a specific change, uh, it can be hard to do it with the nuclease because first, to, to really be able to do that, you either need to be extremely lucky and the end joining products happen to be the change you want, which almost never happens, or uh, you need to rely on HDR. And HDR um, you know, works well in a small number of cell types. Um, it generally does not work well in non-dividing cells. And even in some dividing cell types, it does not work particularly well. So to, to, to perform a, a, a precise gene correction, where you're converting a targeted gene to something else, uh, if you can do it uh, using a base editor or a prime editor, um, I think, you know, that's, that's certainly a way that many people have started to do this now. And, and uh, I mean, just recently, uh, uh, Vijay Sankran and Eric Lander and others published a paper where they did an enormous genetic screen, and it was all done uh, using base editing because they um, wanted to make precise changes in the DNA and not generate mixtures of indel products. So it, like everything in science, it depends on your particular application. But I think for research purposes, if your goal is to change a DNA sequence to another DNA sequence and not to change a DNA sequence into a disrupted mixture of indels, then uh, using a base editing or a prime editing approach makes a lot of sense. Sorry, we can't see because there's a spotlight blinding us. <laughs> right, Wond wonderful work. Congratulations. Uh, I think it's really eye-opening to see how many editing tools for DNA are now available. It made me think always about the HIV cure and chronic viral diseases cure because the latent reservoir elimination through gene editing has been on people's mind for a very long time. Uh, but it all started with the imperfect zinc finger nucleases and such. And, and what really is the bottleneck, I think it's the quantitative delivery to the specific cell type so you can erase most of the active reservoir. How far do you think the, the targeted delivery can actually go? You know, yeah. can you engineer the viral-like particles so that they really recognize just one cell, cell type and have the enhanced ability to fuse with the cells and actually deliver the cargo efficiently? Right. I mean, what, first, it's a, great, uh, it's a great point. You could give a whole lecture on exactly this point. And, and you know, gene editing applied is especially challenging to apply to two kinds of therapeutic uh, indications, infectious disease and cancer, because those are ones in which directly going after the cause requires you to edit virtually 100% of the target. Now, of course, you can go after cancer through, as demonstrated by Alyssa's case, through using the immune system to amplify the effect. But uh, directly editing cancerous genes or directly editing uh, HIV to destroy its potential to propagate uh, will work for those copies, but the the key, the the I think the hardest part, as you've already pointed out, is how do you access all of the latent reservoirs? Um, that can be a challenge. I don't think your approach is going to be obsolete anytime soon because we will always need uh, ways to suppress latent reservoirs. Um, but I think gene editing can be an interesting uh, tool to uh, both maybe debulk. Uh, uh, some of the, the viral load, and uh, uh, maybe more fancifully, you could imagine some creative ways that will require lots and lots of past precedents so people get much more comfortable with gene editing, but to actually go after the viruses in ways that um, cause them to exert a dominant transacting negative effect on each other. That's one way you can go after infectious disease, much like using the immune system to exert a dominant um, uh, sort of outsized effect on, on latent reservoirs, you can imagine uh, doing so by actually editing the viruses themselves to do so. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's thank Dave again. Thank you.
I think uh, the two speakers today set um, an incredibly high bar <laughs> for the, the Martin Memorial Lecture. We heard about what could be effectively the first vaccine for the treatment of HIV in, in many, many, many years, which could really impact and potentially eradicate HIV. And then we heard from Dave uh, about an approach um, to, 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 to DNA, um, genomic DNA manipulation that could actually uh, lead to, to the end of genetic diseases in, in many cases. So. Uh, we're going to have to think about hard who to invite next year. <laughs> um, but I'd love to finish up with a few words from Bill Lee. Um, Bill um, worked for many years with, with John Martin um, and uh, was executive vice president of research at Gilead and played a major role in the success of Gilead, I think, um, Bill was involved in the discovery, development, and, and, and commercialization of, of 18 um, uh, drugs uh, while at, at, at Gilead, which is pretty remarkable. And he was a co-inventor on TAF, um, which in itself was a great achievement. So uh, I'd like to, to finish with Bill saying uh, a few words. Bill? So John's legacy is clearly the 10 million people every day who take a Gilead origin antiretroviral therapy for HIV, the millions of people who have been cured from hepatitis C virus, the millions of people who are on, our, on Gilead's chronic hepatitis B virus therapies, Tamiflu for influenza, and even remdesivir for COVID. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm, I'm actually going to poke a little fun at John and sort of introduce you to him as a person, how we saw him, how we experienced him at Gilead, and, and share a little history uh, of the company and John as well. And so let me start with a, a picture from 1991. John was, had come on to the company and, and come to the company in 1990. He was head of R&D, and back then it was Big R, little d. John is on the, uh, on the far right there. He looks like he's about 19 years old. Uh, Jeff Bird on the far left, Mike Reardon, the founder of the company, and Tony Holy in the middle, who became a really big part of the whole uh, Gilead experience, and then Max Hinsley next to him, our IP lawyer. Moving on to... Uh, 1991, this is the first Gilead uh, offsite meeting, and this is senior management, quite a, a ragtag group. That's John in the red, still looking very young. The bearded fellow on the right is Swami Nathan, and he's somewhere here as well. Uh, this was, you know, we were still sharing rooms back then when we, we stayed at a couple houses in Amparo Dunes. Dunes. Moving on to 1994, this is, uh, John's looking a little more corporate now. Uh, we actually do have development candidates. This is a picture of the board of directors with Mike Reardon and, and John at our pilot plant. We had uh, built a pilot plant at this point. And that's, as you might notice, uh, there's Don Rumsfeld, uh, Gordon Moore, and George Schultz, who have all passed away in the last several years. And then this is 1996. This is a this is with Eric DeClerc on the far right, Tony Holy, John, and Mike Reardon. And uh, this is when John became CEO. Mike, Mike Reardon stepped down. He was founder, initial CEO. He stepped down from the company, uh, became chairman of the board for a short period of time, and, and John took over CEO. And you know, that was really the, the beginning of, the, uh, of where Gilead really took off as a company, both in terms of R&D as well as, uh, as in a commercial company. Now, those of us who knew John, John liked to make rules. He liked to make rules for himself. He liked to make rules for you. He had rules about everything. And, and most, of those, you know, most of those rules were contradictory at times. And so 
Uh, my next slide, I hope you can read some of this, is captures some of John's rules in an April Fool's edition from 1996. And I'm not going to read all of these, but most of these are actually, he has said these at one time or another. And uh, John was, he was passionate about traveling and upgrading. And they, and that kept coming up. And John was always instructing him on getting to the airport early, et cetera. And I'm going to read a few of them, but I'm going to focus on a few of the early ones and focus on, on 10. And uh, one of them is John was always at upgrade because we never, you know, we could never fly business class, but upgrading is what you sought to do. And, you know, upgrade early. I do it when I get up at 2 a.m. to go, go to work. Never check your luggage. This is going to come back. And it goes on about getting to the red carpet club. And here's John asleep at the red carpet club uh, at, at some point. But number 10 is, is probably my favorite. And this is tips on beating jet lag. So don't sleep on the flight. When you arrive, go to sleep right away to reset your internal clock, OK? Don't eat too much on the flight because it disrupts your natural body rhythms, OK? Have a few drinks, allow your body to relax. And then D, sleep on the flight. Then when you arrive, stay up as long as possible and you'll enter. And I, I promise you, he said this at various times. And then eat a good meal on the flight so you'll be in tune with the local time when you arrive. Never drink on the flight. So this was the sort of thing over the years that you know we put up with over and over. Now, in about 2010, the company had grown substantially uh, from the 90s. And, and there were a lot of people in the company who, who didn't know much about uh, the history of the company, about nucleotides, nucleosides, and where those products they were currently uh, selling, marketing, had come from. So John asked me to put together a talk to sort of familiarize the operating group at the time about the histo, about Gilead and about nucleotides. So I, I, I reworked one of his old presentations that he had given. And this is John Martin's History of Gilead, Part 1, The Nucleotides, as read by myself. And I started that with a little, uh, little video. And I, you'll recognize it. And <laughs> you can guess. Moses can... went to the mountain, and God spoke unto him. Moses, this is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I punished you, forget it. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I shall give you my laws, and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord! <laughs> Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Wait. 10, 10 commandments for all to obey. I warned you this was a little lighter than you know, David's elegant film at the end. And you, you can guess which voice John was in that. But you know, what was on those tablets? And this was uh, you know, things that John was adamant about. And, and one of them, oh, excuse me, huh? can we adjust that back? Is that, or is that mine? Well, <laughs> so. Nucleotide analogs will be drugs. Now, until this point, uh, it was thought that nucleotides could never actually be useful drugs because they couldn't get into cells. Now, David has just shown us what can get into cells, uh, which, you know, back then, back in the 90s, getting in a doubly charged nucleotide analog was very tough. It's actually still quite tough. So uh, John really believed they could be made drugs. And you know, one of the reasons I was hired was to, to help, help do that. Uh, and then, of course, it only matters if it's on the inside of a cell. 
because the target of a nucleotide, a nucleoside triphosphate, is actually a polymerase, which is inside a cell. And so it doesn't matter what that plasma concentration is. And John fundamentally understood this. He, he really you know, believed that if you get the molecules in cells, there are particular properties, that phosphorylation, that half-life, which would make these valuable therapeutic agents in the, huge, in the future. And then, of course, John, how many times the people who know him did he say the history of drug development uh, will be overdosing? And you see that often, that you know, we're so anxious to show activity, we dose high, and then we have to back off because every drug has its consequent toxicity. And then, of course, on there is never, ever check luggage because that was a, a pet peeve of his. Uh, so this, the seminar, I, I started with the very basics, that nukes do not equal nukes. And nukes, of course, are nucleosides and nucleotides. And I'm not going to go into the rest of the presentation except for two, two chemistry slides and uh, to acknowledge John and to acknowledge what a lot of Gilead's therapeutics were based on. And this is the John Martin and Early Prisby published in J. Med Chem in 1986, the first isosteric nucleotide analog to show antiviral activity. And this was actually, you, you can see what they have done is replace the oxygen next to the phosphorus with a, a methylene group, making that a phosphonic, a DHPG phosphonic acid. This is DHPG is gancyclovir. The nucleoside is actually an invention of John Martin. So they've taken gancyclovir monophosphate and converted it to a nucleotide analog showing antiviral activity. Now that never turned out to be a useful drug, but it was a, it was a clear demonstration that nucleotide phosphonic acid, nucleotide analogs, could show antiviral activity. Later that year in Nature, Tony Holy and Eric Clerk published a series of both isosteric and isoelectronic nucleotide analogs where they inverted the oxygen and the methylene alpha to the uh, phosphorus. And those molecules showed broad spectrum antiviral activity. And they became the basis of uh, cydofavir, adefavir, uh, tenofavir that Gilead eventually developed into a very broad, uh, potent antiviral uh, therapies across multiple antiviral diseases. John, other, you know, BMS had that license for a while because they actually didn't believe you could ever make drugs out of this class of molecules. Uh, they were given up. John was able to take those in. And for Gilead, as they say, that was, that was history. So fast forward to 2010, uh, based on many of those nucleotide analogs, as well as Tamiflu, Gilead has become a very um, uh, uh, viable company. We had 4,000 employees. We had gone from 40 people when, or 30 people when John started. We were now a company of 4,000. We had revenues. We had a good market cap. We had 13 products on the market. But we were, and we were pursuing multiple therapeutic areas. Uh, as well as other viruses, for instance, hepatitis C. And it's something that we had been working on for about nine years in, in 2010. And of course, we were looking at everybody else who was working. This was, this was the disease to attack and uh, the antiviral disease to go after in 2010. And so we saw a publication from Pharmacet, actually an abstract, a poster at an easel meeting where they showed potent activity in a small number of patients for a nucleotide analog. And it's the same space we had been working in. And John was convinced that you know, we needed that molecule, and he went after it. And John drove the acquisition of Pharmacet for $11 billion. And of course, at the time, that was the highest anybody had paid for a biotech company. Uh, the street did not like it. In fact, John was called uh, by the street, you know, the fifth worst uh, CEO in America in 2011. CNBC, the day after we announced the deal, called John the worst CEO in America. So, you know, 
stock crashed. We had just spent a third of our market cap for this phase 2A data. Four years later, there were four, we had four hepatitis C products on the market. We cured hepatitis C with a single tablet for three months administration. And it revolutionized therapy for hepatitis C. It changed Gilead. It, it, it changed, changed the world. And it's still being, these, these products are still being used globally to bring down hepatitis infection rates and hepatitis disease in patients globally. So 2015, uh, Gilead, now we have doubled in size. Market cap is way up there, 22, product, 22 products. This is John's last year as CEO, and he became chairman of the board after, in 2016. Uh, you know, Gilead is ranked 118 on the Fortune 500 companies, and, uh, you know, John is looked at as he should have been as an innovator, a, someone who's really made a difference in global health. And so, you know, John has, ma has made globally such a difference. He's made such a difference to everybody who's interacted with him. And there are a few lessons, you know, I'll finish with a few lessons that I have gotten from John. Clearly, the improbable is indeed possible. You know, there's a lot of things that you think will, will never work. You know, John wasn't one to accept that. And, uh, and from 40 people, when I joined the company, to you know, the current, what are we, Tomas, 14, 15,000. I mean, it's been, it was an amazing ride, and, and John drove you know, the majority of that. John also trusted people to do, to do great things, and he trusted people beyond what their experience was. He found good people, he trusted them. They may not have known the answer to start with, but they, they were the sort of people who went out and got the answer, and you know, once he trusted you, he allowed you a tremendous amount of freedom. He also made you pay attention to the details. You know, so many of us gloss over things. John was a very stickler for those, for those details, those scientific details. The other thing, everybody always talks about focus on the patients, but sometimes what they really mean is focus on the market. John really meant focus on the patients. And because you can, you know, if you let marketing make your decisions for you, there's so many things that you won't do. Marketing has the great ability to predict three to four months in advance. They can't predict five, 10 years in advance. So where is the need? That's where you need to focus your efforts in terms of discovery. And then finally, and I'll let you go after that, never ever check luggage. <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, We'll see you outside. That was great. Thanks, Phil. That was wonderful. Um, and, and finally, I just I want to acknowledge um, Lily. Lily um, took on John's place on our uh, on our on our board and has. Uh, been filling his shoes, continuing to offer really terrific advice and helping scripts in many ways. So thank you, Lily, too. Um, and finally, um, <laughs> finally, I, I, I do think there are drinks outside. So let's let's uh, thank all the speakers again, and uh, Lily, and let's uh, exchange ideas. Mm -hmm.